I just... Welcome to Meet the Voter, episode 10, and we're live and it's Sunday. It's Sunday, December 10th, 20th, 2015, and it's time for Meet the Voter at meetthevoter.com, episode 10, 10 a.m. Pacific time. This week on Meet the Voter, we have our panelist, uh, Jonathan Denwood, is with me as the co-host. We also have Roxanne Davenport. Jonathan, of course, is our socialist Democrat. Did I do that right? Socialist Democrat? Yeah, I did. Um, English, whatever. Well, Roxanne is uh, our one of our hosts coming in, representing the Midwest. And I'm not sure. Are you a Republican or Democrat, Roxanne? Was Republican. Now I changed to independent. Okay. We're going to be talking for the next uh, next episode. The first two episodes are what we record for iTunes. And then we're going to open it up and stay on for about an hour, an hour and a half on YouTube, but you can watch that too. It's very, very good dialogue. So this week on Meet the Press, we all watched Meet the Press. We watched some of the uh, debate. And what we found was um, it was sort of an interesting week, I thought. I thought there was some consolidation. Uh, what do you think, Jonathan? Um, it, uh, I, I thought it was a little bit boring myself, what I watched. Um, you know, they discussed a little bit about the Democratic um, mm-hmm debate they didn't mention bernie that much what's what, what's unusual um i just like your feedback about it what was your main um notable moments of it well since i'm i'm the moderator i'm going to ask roxanne oh yeah roxanne what do you think well boring no because of what had happened with sanders thought with the voter with the voter data you know, I mean, <laughs> that was a little boring. Oh. Well, I, I think um, I think he dealt with it in a in a very um, honourable, upfront way. You know, the individual or individ, the indiv, first individual has been fired, and he's mm-hmm. having an internal investigation, and he's made it quite clear that if anybody in his team has been found actively utilising that data, they're going to be fired as well. And um, I really feel that as long as it can't be proven that he actively encouraged people of his team to indulge in that, and it was an active policy that came from him, I think what he has said and the way he has dealt with it is sufficient. Well... I thought it was, well, it could have been funny because maybe it brought more attention to him. Yeah, that's true, actually, Roxanne. I I, I think, actually, um, in a strange way, he's benefited because Mm -hmm. it's forced the um, traditional press to actually discuss his candidacy a bit more. So, yeah, I agree with you there, actually. (laughs) Let me me cut in here, and when we look at that deeper – it was interesting to see that the uh, DNC's uh, security was down and they got in because they had bad security. So these guys, I tell you what, the Democrats, I just don't think get it when it comes to ops or security online. Well, uh, I, you've, got, you've got another thing happen this week, too. I want to talk about um, Carter, uh, I'm trying to think of his name, the Secretary of Defense, who I think is very weak, was using his private email um, for official business. So he violated FOIA right away. So the press pounded him for FOIA. Now there's going to be an investigation congressional investigation on the secretary. And I think the secretary is absolutely clueless as the secretary. So that, I mean, Democrats just don't get it. Whole Obama administration doesn't understand security online. Um, that goes on to my second half when we talk about security. So we, we didn't really talk about that a lot. The press isn't really talking about it. Ian, I think it's Carter. I can't think of his name. Ian Carter, I think is the secretary of defense. Ash Carter. He's really weak. Ash Carter, Ash Carter. Yeah. 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 So anyway, they didn't really talk about that today, meet the press. But going back, um, we I watched the debate. Do you guys catch the Democrat debate? I watched it. Yeah. All. It was nice because it was on normal TV. We didn't have to have C-SPAN, and I actually um, watched it online, and which I think is good. So hats off to the Democrats. Their timing, though, doing it on like a holiday night was kind of weak. Mm-hmm. I thought it was a good debate overall. What, what do you guys think, uh, Jonathan? What do you think? It was okay. Um, I think it shows up a little bit of some of the, um, if Bernie did. Um, first of all, I just want to respond when you said, that um, that the Sanders team actually hacked in to oh, yeah. that database. What 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 
it's been reported and what um, what was said during the debate was that it was the third party that provides this data. They actually did a data dump to, oh, the, okay, yeah. to the Sanders and they didn't actually hack. The Sanders team didn't actually hack. And that had previously happened before where um, data had been shared to Ber um, Bernie's campaign um, but um, individuals then hadn't chosen to actually look at the data and try and utilize it. That's been the main difference. Yeah. Um, I think when it got to the debate, um, I think it showed one of Sanders' problems. Um, I think he is capable of be beating Hillary, but if he goes up against Trump, um, into a one-to-one -one debate, I'm not sure that Sanders has the capacity to take on a, a somebody like Trump in a one-to-one -one debate and by power of his personality be victorious in that debate. I have my doubts. It's funny, I was thinking the same thing. The uh, on, on Sanders, he's done a couple things. First of all, he forgave her for the email and that makes me realize how naive he is on that kind of security intelligence. And one thing that happened is his 39-year-old PhD uh, social media computer guy is the guy they just fired, their head guy. And and being in campaigns, that's that's a critical spot to lose, but he had to do that. So he's once removed. I've been in a lot of campaigns, and I can't tell you how many times the people you hire or the people around you really screw up for the candidate, and you take you take the blunt of it. So I'm a big believer in a very, very small staff around a candidate, very small controlled staff. And even your volunteers, one step out can cause you problems, but that's a whole different topic that maybe we'll have a special episode on campaigns as a filler. But uh, yeah, I, I thought he did well. I, I mean, I I don't agree with his socialist approach because I think it'll lead to crony capitalism, the nth degree, even though he has good intentions, but I think he's a good man. I think he's probably one of the most honest people running for office right now. Yeah. So that said, I don't agree with, I think some of his policies will lead to a lot of crony capitalism, socialism, all that, all those things lead to, I think, bad things, good intentions, but bad things. And that's, I'm the right, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm Bill Conrad, the Republican from the right. Jonathan, you're the socialist Democrat today, but I don't consider you way off to the left. You're left on some stuff, but a lot of stuff. Oh, I'm probably actually more leftist than um, some of your other panelists, but on the other hand, I'm not prepared to sacrifice um, logic just for biology. Um, hopefully I won't. Um, we all got blind spots. Um, I, obviously I totally disagree with your, you know, um, and it's not unusual from um, established republicans to say socialism, it will lead to this, to that. Um, there's, you know, um, there's all fault there. <coughs> sorry, I'm a capitalist. There. There's all sort. Um, there's all forms of socialism. There's socialism that that is prepared to work fundamentally in a capitalist system, um, but just wants um, those systems to be democratic and, to some extent, to be a, accountable to the larger community. And then you have more analytic, uh, more extreme socialists that. Um, not communists, but want most of the key elements of production of, of, of industry like transportation, energy, um, to be in the public sector, to be um, controlled directly. Um, but that's an interesting debate because um, there was, um, uh, I don't think it was on the media, it was, um, I was it, uh, I do apologize. Um, well, you know what? This is a great time to come back from a break. Hold that thought, yeah. and we'll come back with Jonathan's thought after the break. Okay, that means it's a quick commercial to support the show. You know, folks, there's two places you can support the show. You go over to netcasting101.com and sign up for the uh, course. I'm, turning, I'm developing a course that basically teaches people what I do. Basically, every morning at 9 o'clock, I do a timelines interview. We, it goes up at 9. It is put on to, uh, by 12 o'clock, it's on iTunes. So it goes from Blab to YouTube and then to iTunes, and then it goes on a little website. So that's what I'm teaching on the course. 
it's a pre pre uh, market right now for about forty dollars. But that's how you support the course. Jonathan has got WP Dash Tonic. He's got some amazing platforms for websites, and he goes into programming and development. So go over to WP Dash Tonic dot com and you'll find some of the offers some of the things that he does but uh we if you've got a commercial grade platform we've got something called digital ocean which really is a complicated difficult thing to set up but allows you to expand and, and get as big as any ford motor corporation at&t whatever it might be i guess i shouldn't really use names so ford i i, I apologize but the idea was it allows you to have a super big powerful website down the road if you want to grow there without further ado let's get right back into meet the voter MeetTheVoter.com. Nick, Dr. Nicholas Hernandez has uh, joined us. He's our progressive Democrat from Laguna Beach, California. He's also an artist and a sculptor. But we're going to go back to Jonathan. I was going to finish that thought before the break. Yeah, and the um, senators Rub Rubio, is it? Yes. Um, what was interesting? Um, the, like I was finishing off you know, the different types of socialism, and what's come out last week is when it comes to the cable companies and the telecommunication and seemingly some of the biggest backers of Rubio are in those industry sectors. And there's, um, there's a um, count authority run um, cable. Um, I think it's, I forgot it's in Kansas or um, that, um, they're suing because the council's making such a um, the authority runs the cable network, and um, they're doing such a good job that um, what Rubio is trying to support is a bill that would outlaw local authorities to run such systems. And he's he wrote a letter um, supporting <laughs> this. Um, attempt to decrease competition um, and this is a geezer that reckons he's all for free enterprise and competition well he isn't he's he's for free enterprise for his crony backers jonathan let me uh, cut in I, i'm not going to go into detail now but i been, i was a councilman for almost six years vice mayor of a city of two hundred thousand, and i can tell you all about the cable company's local control uh you know, I went off to war, so I missed a lot of stuff. There is some legislation in California where they consolidated and they took some of that power away from the cities. Kind of interesting. But uh, you're 100% correct. They are a total special interest. But you know where they really control people? At the local council level, getting council members elected. And it's truly a monopoly within these communities. And we really need competition. And in Kansas, uh, there's about 11 outlying cities around Kansas City. I happen to be there because I was there for training afterward and I got friends there. And they brought in Google Fiber, which just is wiping everybody out. And it's excellent. One city voted down Google Fiber and they didn't get it. It was hysterical because they, they balked and because the local cable company, you know, talked the council out of it. So interesting to see that evolve. But yeah, uh, Roxanne. Well, one thing that I didn't like about Rubio, uh, he didn't go to vote. Okay, here goes my voice. That's okay. <clears throat> he didn't vote when they went. To Congress to have a vote, and that's that gets under my skin because that's what they get paid to do. So he was out, uh, just I forgot where he was, but just campaigning, and he should have went back to Washington D.C. to do what he's paid for. You know? Yeah, like Bernie. Bernie's had more of his, you know voted more than any anybody else on the campaign trail. <clears throat> he's gone back every time for his votes. He's missed one yeah. out of several hundred. Yeah, well, Roxanne brings up a very good point because it was brought up in the debate Rubio's um, voting record or lack of voting record. And you're absolutely right, Roxanne. It's been atrocious. It, it's, a, it's, you know, it's a joke. But it has been brought up. I think it was actually brought up by Mr. Trump. And, um, um, and he, he didn't really get a very satisfactory answer off Rubio why such a appalling um, track record is good enough. Um, I didn't really think any of his an his answers uh, was I, right. I pay attention to that because that's what they get paid for. Yeah. Let, let me jump in here for a second and sort of change the direction of the. Yeah. They one thing they looked at at Meet the Press today, which I really like because it's like my hobby and i've helped a lot of people in campaigns and worked in a lot of campaigns they talked about the change campaign and i brought this up in california um, between deployments 
how you, it's not this belly to belly politics quite the same anymore. Um, Trump is not going is only going to major events, major things and showing up and doing a lot of social media. Uh, these other candidates, some of them are doing a lot of belly to belly politics and running themselves ragged, getting tired. And the whole way we're campaigning is changing the cycle. And they talked about that today. Rubio's can't using an old system, even though he's got young folks, he's still doing that belly to belly. And I agree. You'd be better off voting right now and really empowering social media and then showing up for the major events. Trump is doing that. He's just flying his plane around, showing up, staying rested. He's not making a lot of appearances. I don't. I think that polit- that's the new kind of politics we're seeing right now, and I think it works. Even local races, I think it works sometimes. I've seen candidates work too hard, run around, wear themselves out, and do stupid things at debates. Uh, this is such a strange form. Any, any thoughts on that, uh, Nick? Well, um, oh boy, Bill, the Trump... I think his whole campaign is stupid. He's feeding off of stupid. Well, no, I mean, no, no. He's not I'm talking about the mechanics of the campaign, not the message. Yeah. Not the message, Nick. The and, actual, yeah. the actual okay, mechanic, that, the actual mechanics of his. Campaign. What he's doing, in mechan- His mechanics is, you know, he's leading in mechanic wise, and he's also tagging into social media. Jonathan, what well, do you? Think? I, I totally agree with you. Actually, you bring up a really excellent point, and I, 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 I want. I agree with you there, but I also brought up a point, Nick. I, d- I don't know at the time you were able to hear it, Nick. But um, I actually think Bernie does stand a chance of becoming the Democratic candidate, but I have my worries, Nick, about Bernie's capacity in a one-to-one debate with with Mr. Trump. They say Mr. Trump does become the, Demo- the Republican candidate. I really do have concerns about Bernie's ability to go head to head in a debate with somebody like Trump. I don't uh, because when their candidates are finally chosen, you know, when, when the, uh, the primaries are over, it's going to really be about issues. And Trump uh, is, he doesn't talk about issues. He just blusters and, you know, he's feeding off of the fear. He's fear baiting, you know, and he, and I, I do agree with you, Jonathan, that there's a strong possibility Bernie will get the even though uh, get the uh, nomination, even though I think Hillary had a good debate last night. But the thing about Hillary is supposedly she's got quite a few more people, registered Democrats, uh, voting for her. But when they ask how strongly they are backing Hillary, she's at very interested or very strong. She's got 39% of her people. That uh, means that about 40 to 42, 43% are going to come out to vote of all the people that say that they uh, are for Hillary because it's mostly the people that are very interested and strongly agree with her that are the voters. Bernie is at 78%. If you notice, most of the people that are for Bernie are strongly, really uh, for Bernie, they're they're very passionate about yeah. it. Yeah. Um, so I, his voting I, I, numbers yeah. are going to come out. Yeah, I do agree with you. But what I would like from Roxanne, actually, I, I just want to see um, if Roxanne kind of agrees. Is what where I disagree with you, Nick, is that I think that Mr. Trump does um, discuss some very not. I think you're correct. He doesn't discuss things in the very um, detailed way that Bernie has. But I do think he has touched on some very broad trigger topics that a lot of, lot of if you let me finish, um, a lot of Republican voters are concerned about. Uh, they they are concerned about immigration. His policies, I totally disagree to some extent, but he he deals with immigration. He deals with this feeling of a lot of blue collar Republican voters that um, the Republican establishment through these trade agreements are taking their jobs away. They agree that America's standing is in decline. What do you think, Roxanne? Do you think he is touching some broad buttons in Republicans? Yeah, they also talked about what they would do with the budget, how they were, both of them were pretty close on their ideas of raising taxes for the, I forgot how much they would, they got made per year. I forgot the, uh, the, uh, the cutoff, but 
Um, it ended up being where, uh, what was it? A um, dollar and six cents change. Oh, time. Oh, my. No, keep no, Roxanne, finish your conversation. The way it goes, you finish oh. your conversation and I just say that's a great time to break. So. Oh, yeah. And they were pretty close, him and Trump, on what they talked about. So he worked on, you know, what he was saying. And I didn't know if you want me to bring up again if Nick heard what I said about them two also agreeing on uh, Saddam Hussein. And Well, that's going to go to a break. But I'm going to come back after the break with a quick question from Nick, forecast, and we'll finish up the iTunes portion. But I'm going to give you the question to think of, Nick, uh, during the break. What do you think about Trump and Bernie Sanders' policy in the uh, dealing with Syria. Okay. I just, I, I just cut it already. So I'm going to ask you that question. Still I thought the policy off the, by the way, I thought I liked that policy a lot, both of Bernie Sanders and they're almost the same. Two still good policies. You, huh? You're still yeah. recording. Oops. Okay. For uh, this break, it's like a PR announcement. I just want to thank the different groups who are coming up. We have an, uh, and putting this uh, show on their website and anyone, it's a, it's an open site. If you go to meet the voter, meet the .com, there's nothing called iframe. You can take that iframe, that code and embed it ahead of time. We put it up a few days ahead of time on your website. We want to thank the RMC from Northern Nevada for embedding it today. Uh, also uh, new media gold. And of course it's on, uh, timelines and a couple other places plus this this itunes will be on timelines today on sunday until it finds a home so without that we're going to go to the question we just asked nick and again coming back that question is how do you feel about the policy of bernie sanders and donald trump about you know taking care of isis first instead of going after uh, the syrian president assad yeah i uh, completely agree um you know, look what's happened when we got rid of uh, Saddam and when we got rid of Gaddafi. You know, we turned over those vast portions of those countries over to ISIS and ISIS developed there. So we really messed that up and we were off target there. And I think that we also don't have the right. You know, it's their country. They'll, they'll let those people do it. Not not us. ISIS is an international situation. But as far as they're the people that rule them. Hopefully, they'll, they'll have a democratic process that will do it. But we need to get rid of ISIS right now. And, okay, very, and I agree with both of them that that's the first thing. Very good. I thought that was very good, too. I actually, I, I'm opposed on, on Trump on many different issues, but I sort of like some of his foreign policy. Some of it, not the bombing of the civilians, which we talked about the first period. We're not going to go into that now. Hey, predictions. We're going to talk about predictions. Well, I like the panelists to do. Go ahead and give me your predictions, your uh, short-term, long-term, and then email those in to me so I can paste them. It's a lot of work figuring out what you guys say sometimes. So go ahead and give me a prediction. I can go over a little bit what your yeah. last predictions were. Do you want me to start, Bill? Yeah, start, start Jonathan. Yeah. I think I'll start because my predictions haven't changed, Bill. Um, I don't. Uh, I see the, um, the climate um, will encourage more political violence. Um Next That's the, year, the next year from external and internal sources. Um, I actually see, <clears throat> which was touched upon on Meet the Press a bit, you know, about us all coming, you know, the media try and discuss that we should all come together, blah, 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 where the reality is the political climate. Um, there's a struggle for the soul of this country. Um, when it comes to my other short prediction, um, I, I only see Trump getting stronger, and I don't think the Republican establishment have any idea um, how to stop him. And I think, um, obviously, we got the first um, primaries coming up. They hope that he's going to be rejected, and then his popularity will die out. I think they're deluding themselves. I I think he um, he might have problems with the first primary because of the Christian right element in that primary. But I think he's got a strong um, populist base in the consciousness of the Republican Party. All right, Jonathan, do me a favor. Send me a two-liner on email when you're done because you modified the short term just a little bit. You add a little bit more to it. So that's good, though. I appreciate it. And uh, Roxanne, what, what, give us your predictions. 
Uh, well, I'm still predicting Trump and Cruz because if Trump, you know, they predict, they decide him to be nominated, that he still needs someone who knows more about government. So he, he would choose Cruz, vice president. And for after this week, Saunders, I think he did real well. And I don't think he would definitely choose Hillary. So Trump, because of the way the people agree with him and like him. So, and they both believe what they should have done overseas. So, I know that sounds odd. <laughs> no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. I, that's fine. So, anyway, that's good, Roxanne. And finally, Nick, uh, want to again, all these predictions are on the website right now. Episode ten, the old ones. If there's any modifications, Nick, you want to come up and uh, give us a heads up. Yeah. Well, I I uh, starting to think that um, there is a possibility that Trump won't uh, implode. I think it'd be great if he runs because I think he'd be really easy to beat. And uh, uh, I, because he's popular with the GOP, but with nobody else, he's still uh, a joke in most people's minds, you know, except for those people that are afraid. You know, when during that Republican debate, you know, I never heard the word poverty. I never heard the word um, income inequality. I never heard that phrase. I never heard any of... Um, you know, uh, about the, our horrible infrastructure and, and how it needs, you know, such massive repair. So many of the real grounded issues that, you know, not this, oh, there's ISIS is going to come for our babies. You know, that's, you know, they. I never heard about uh, gun control or, and, and again, even Hillary said we were losing 33,000 a year on in last night on the debate, you know, which comes to 90.41 people a day by guns. And, you know, uh, never heard uh, any of the real issues, you know, a little bit about immigration. And then the rest was about uh, ISIS and fear mongering. And of course, it was obvious that Nick, they got your long term, short term projections or opinions. I, we, we okay. want to tie this down. What's your long term opinion? Yeah, what's your long term opinion? Bernie's going to win. Another thing, too, is just, just advice. Yeah. Okay. When you, when you call people like Bozo, that's a personal attack. We want to really get at the, the information and not attack. You know, not use names. We want to go. Back. Boy, it's hard with Trump. Okay. <laughs> I mean, just sorry, same fact. I, I'm not a Trump supporter, so you know that. And yeah. I'm not a Trump supporter primarily because he wants to bomb civilians, and that's not what we do in America. There's some things well, that he's doing right, though. Yeah. Well, I I I disagree, Bill. But yeah, What's I don't your, like that bombing. What's your, short term, what's your short term and your long term, Nick? Well, I think uh, there's a possibility that uh, when Trump does get the nomination, which he will, then he will uh, implode. Right. Okay. You, and you've sort of stuck with those. The short term was uh, Trump's numbers will go down and he will implode, mm -hmm. and Bernie Sanders will win in a landslide. I'm going to ask you about that, Bernie Sanders. I Unless something comes up with the FBI, I don't think he's going to win in a landslide. Looking at what the Democrat machine is doing, the Democrat machine seems to be going against Bernie, the, the establishment. And that's the ones I hate. I think those are the – and I, maybe I use the word crony capitalist because that's what we call when government and capitalism gets to bed. And I think the Democrats are really hooked into that, that socialism, crony capitalism, along with the Republicans in the middle. Well, not Bernie. Not Bernie. Not Bernie. I'm saying not Bernie. But that's what I'm saying is – that establishment yeah. behind Hillary. I also, I want to jump in quickly, Bill. I do uh, object to you linking the Democratic establishment, which I totally agree with you. That's in bed with corporate America and link it to the word socialist. Um, they are definitely not socialist in any shape or form. Socialist, my, as a Christian socialist, is open it to democracy regional government, all the things that I've discussed on this show, Bill. Would you say Bernie Sanders is leaning towards socialism, though? Well, he's a, he's a social, um, obviously, um, Democratic Dr. Socialist. Dr. Nick is a better spokesman for this, but he's a democratic socialist. Um, Absolutely. But, but most Americans, unfortunately, and I don't know if Nick agrees with this, have no ideas what is the fundamental difference between a um, a Christian democratic socialist or a, a democratic socialist to this broader term socialist. They they just don't seem to have any understanding, Bill. With that, Jonathan, um, we're going to tighten up the iTunes portion of this, the Apple iTunes, and we're going to open this up for more discussion 
uh, when we come back, uh, finishing up the iTunes. Hey, I want to thank everybody who's out there listening on iTunes. It's pre-recorded RSS feed. Jonathan, uh, Roxanne, excellent job. Nick, thanks for making it up. Hey, you look great today. Your colors are amazing. Nick is on a new Chromebook out there, folks. So yeah, it's uh, amazing, that's this Chromebook. He's doing great. And that's one of our things we're teaching here on netcasting101.com. Hey, good job. Thank you, panel. Excellent job today. Everyone stay online because we're going to go up with the um, YouTube. We're not going anywhere. Bye -bye. Hey, bye-bye. Wait a second, wait a second. Not yet. I got to whoops, I'm recording. Oh my gosh. <laughs> we did. <laughs>Folks, this is Adam on the YouTube. We've never seen this. This is a blabism. We wow. got Roxanne is Latifa. Hi, Latifa. This is crazy. Sorry, Latifa. She stole your name. Interesting. <laughs> anyway, that's why I love this. I love Blab, and it's the best platform to start. But you just got to get used to its unique elements. Yeah. Hey, Roxanne, I want to leave that open for a while. For other, and she can he still hear it too, which is strange. Yeah. Hey, can someone up? We're still recording right now, but uh, can one of you guys jump up? From yeah, please jump up one of you guys. See what's oh, happening, Rob, so we can see what's going on. I with love, Rob. I love for Rob Hicks to come on. I really would. Love oh, Rob. Rob is my capitalist buddy. Rob, please yeah. come on, Rob. I want to debate with you, Rob. And, and <laughs> he's also uh, a vapor. He vapes, which is okay because we have a lot of vape conventions here in Reno, Nevada. I think Roxanne is still with us in a way, Bill. Are you sure you? I, we can hear Roxanne. Roxanne's that secret spirit behind. Us. Hey, Roxanne, do me a favor. Recycle your computer. I uh, just yeah, re can, can you recycle? It. Just reboot. So, shall we go on with the debate, Bill? And see oh, absolutely. And we want somebody else to jump in. So, and we're yeah. live. We're recording right now. So, so, um, so, Nick, what was your response to the democratic debate, and what were your initial impressions? Where do you think the key points? Did we learn anything new about the candidates in the debate? Well, no, uh, not so much. I don't think you know everybody's rehashing everything. You know, all their positions and trying to shore up their positions, but. I did think that Hillary had a pretty good uh, debate this time, stronger than she's had before. Uh, you know, it didn't budge me from wanting Bernie because I personally don't trust. Hi, Jenna. I personally don't Hi, Jenna. trust Jenna. Um, Hillary. How are you? So, um, so keep on going, guys. Yeah. yeah and uh, what are you talking about? I'm not going to be mean, but this is a show. Yeah. So when somebody comes on, I'm going to have to let yeah, you go. Yeah, you're going to have to bounce the bill. She doesn't know. Yeah. Hey, folks, that's part of the show to make it good for the listeners. Um, I'm not trying to hurt your feelings. And I really want you to pay attention and watch. But I'm going to have to throw people out when they do that. Because we do record this. And come on. by the way, go ahead, Nick. We yeah, go, Nick. Um, well, I, I think, you know, uh, the, the 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 phrase that the DNC, the Democratic National Committee, has their thumb on the scale, tipping it for Hillary, is an understatement, and uh, I've known noticed that from the very beginning. Also, the same with uh, the media. And but the one thing that happened with uh, the DNC cutting off Bernie's uh, um, data was uh, that a lot more people did come to watch. You know, the DNC has scheduled these debates for Saturday night for the very reason they don't want a lot of people seeing Hillary. <coughs> Excuse me. Because what happens, you know, you've got like 18 million people watching the Republican debate because it's Tuesday night when everybody's, you know, home watching it. But on a holiday Saturday night, and all their debates have been Saturday night, you've got four or five million people watching th the debates. And then the next, you know, within minutes, the media is saying Hillary killed it. Hillary tore it up. I say this was the best uh, debate of the other of the three that I've seen that Hillary had, but she's not tearing it up. I mean, I, I, I think that Bernie is by far, you know, I think Martin O'Malley had a better uh, yeah. debate this this week. I, had, I thought he was a lot better than Hillary. But of course, I, I turn it off, go on to a news broadcast and Hillary killed it just Hillary just murdered it and, and that's a lie that's not true and so the media and the DNC totally skewed for Hillary but Debbie Wasserman the chair of the DNC I think made a real bad mistake because first of all the there was a lot of attention paid to Bernie and Bernie got a lot of press <clears throat> ever since Friday since, since that data breach happened 
Now, I don't know, you guys, but, but you know, with Debbie Wasserman being the chair and the 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 CEO of that company, the data company, is uh, what worked for Hillary on her campaign. And then the vice president is Debbie Wasserman's nephew. And if talk about crony capitalism, there you have it. And so to me, it would, what I see, and this is just conjecture, is that they set a trap. They set a trap for Bernie. It's like putting a big steak in front of a big hungry dog and saying, well, you can smell it, but you can't eat it. So just sit and be nice. Yeah. And they went in, the, the, the firewall mysteriously went down. And, you know, the staffer didn't do, according to Bernie, the right thing. But uh, again, it's like like uh, the information that they could have gotten could be very valuable. And I just think that it was a trap that they threw up, you know, because look at the, look at the people that are involved. It's crazy. I, I just thought it was really crazy. Yeah, my, um, I, I totally agree with you, Nick. And um, I just want um, – I've had a few email recently, folks, about my statements about Hillary Clinton saying that I've been grossly unfair to her and that my personal attacks on her record have been totally um, out of bounds and sexist. Um, to a high <laughs> level. Um, no, I do not joke you, Nick. I've received a few. I've received some heat mail, folks. Um, I just want to make. I just want to make this clear, folks. Um, on reflection, maybe my some of my statements have been a little bit hot-headed, but fundamentally, um, I hold Democratic candidates to a higher standard than I do Republican candidates. Um, I consider the majority of Republican candidates are quite clear in their intellectual position that they represent minority populist positions, but fundamentally they're there for the benefit of corporate America and for the elite, and that's what the party is. Um, when it comes to the Democratic Party, um, I hold it to a much higher standard myself. And I, I consider Hiri, her husband, Hiri, and the top echelon of the Democratic Party are totally in bed with these corporate um, entities. And also I consider her to be totally corrupt. Her husband was totally corrupt. And I consider them... Um, a really de detrimental and damaging force in the Democratic Party. Um, so that's why I'm so scathing, folks, because I um, I hold them to a much higher standard than I do people. When it comes to, to the GPO, I'm not surprised about anything because their fundamental ideology is just to benefit the top 1%. And they don't make, they make that quite clear. So I don't. It doesn't that, really bother me. You no, know, if that's their – Jonathan, I'm going to run and get a cup of coffee, but if that's their ideology, they'd never win an election. Well, the win, the reason why they win it is um, populism. Um, obviously, if you attack poor people, you attack – there's always been, over the past 15 years, a strong racial, um, religious, racial element to a lot of the policies that the GPO have put forward. The problem with it, Bill, is when you look at the math, and math doesn't lie fundamentally unless you're Arthur Anderson. Um, basically, um, things don't look good when it comes to presidential elections if you attack minorities, because those minorities are becoming the majorities. So the Hispanic community, the, um, the black community... You know, I, the, these are becoming majorities in a general election, and you're attacking them, Bill. Ironically, I don't think, as a Republican, I don't think Republicans are attacking any minorities. When they say they want to shut the border down and stop illegal immigration, that's against all people, no matter what their race, ridge, color, origin. We have laws. We have to follow the laws. Unfortunately, I know this for a fact from being on election and living in Central Valley, both the Republicans and the Democrats said it's okay to break the law 
and have all this workforce come in the country. I saw that firsthand. And that was your centrist Republican crony capitalism from Democrats and Republicans that just ignored the law. Basically, I think both on the right and the left, they want to try to follow the law somewhat and control the borders. I think those Democrats and Republicans who are controlled by the crony capitalists are the ones that let these borders flood open. And well, I've seen that from the uh, agribusiness in Central California. I lived in Modesto, the home of agribusiness for California. I did. Um, my work, you know, that's what vice mayor. Hey, I'm going to go get a cup of coffee. I'm going to be working the, um, I'm going to open up my seat. I'm going to be working this list right here and getting back with folks. One thing, Jonathan, just a show note, we need to make sure that when we do our first part, someone needs to be, uh, one of us needs to be designated from outside to work the, uh, the text on the right side. There's a lot of good information coming off those texts. Yeah. Are, are you going to, are you yeah. going to make, are you going to make Nick a uh, host as well? Yeah, I'll make, yeah. Um, you're a host right now. Yeah, but make Nick a host yeah. as well, can you? Uh, I'm really careful on this hosting stuff too, so we'll talk about that later. He's a host now, but he has to refresh to become a host, but that's fine. I'll okay. refresh right now. You don't have to now. I'm just okay. saying you don't have to now, but when you do refresh or go out and take a break, hey, I'll be back. I'll be back like in a half hour, 40 minutes, but I'm going to be watching the notes on the side. So leave a seat open. I want to see, you know what, guys? Uh, Rob Hicks said he's going to come in. He's got some uh, guests right now. And we need to get Chuck in. Come on, Chuck. Anybody's welcome to come in. And again, if your sound is bad, don't feel bad if we're cut off or it's, yeah, that's just part of the show. Yeah, all right then, Bill. So, Roxanne, what, what was your response to what I've just said? Well, I, you know, I have epilepsy. And they always talk about the Hispanics and the African Americans, how they always get uh they're just yeah i think we ought to be brought up too they get special um you know anything with companies everything but nobody brings up ada eeoc and i have had to deal with it nobody talks about it and that's just what upsets me because i have been i had to deal with a company treating me horribly because the boss didn't know about the EEOC or ADA. She told a coworker of mine that I had epilepsy. She didn't know the law. Isn't that ridiculous? I, I mean, <laughs> that just upset me. So we are not mentioned whenever they are, they are talking about, here goes my voice. Whenever they talk about the, African Americans. I mean, they are, they are aren't they over percentage of us? Well, I'm sorry, I don't mean this horrible, but aren't there more African Americans now than there are whites? No, no. no. Sorry, no, they're still at ten percent. They're still a very small. No, 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 no. We, well, we, I'll look it up right now, but no, that's not true. There's a lot more the Latinos, uh, you know, because they're coming from all over the place. Um, hey, by the there, there's they're a lot higher, but I'll look it up right now. Let's let's ask the phone. Okay, go right ahead. I mean, I don't mean that bad, but it's just I get upset when they don't mention disabled when anybody's trying to get anything special from the government. Yes, um, Nick, are you U.S. population oh. is? Oh, he's talking to John. <laughs> um, okay, right. Um, Nick, are you are you a host? Can you? Can yes. You, because can you make me a host? Because he hasn't made me a host, I don't think. Yeah, he said that I had to. So over here. Uh, where do I go, Jonathan, to make you a host? Okay. Uh, I have to get build. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm, co I'm a co-host now. Um, I'm going to have to drop um, okay. Chuck. Can you hear us, Chuck? Yes, I can hear yeah, you. We, can you hear yeah, me? Yeah, I can, but you're just audio. But um, just no, quick, I can see him. Oh, you can see him. I can't. Um, <laughs> basically, um, what, what you got any comments about what we've been discussing? Well, I have been uh, typing here on the sidelines and I uh, having some fun. But um, it, it's interesting to me, you know, that I live in a rural community, as uh, Bill had discussed his past. Um, I visit with my neighbors and we're kind of a low income county. We're one of the lowest income counties in the state of California. And uh, since I've been involved in agriculture, a large percentage of my 
friends and people who I socialize with are Hispanic. And, and what I'm amazed at is after work, when the guys are getting off the harvesting olives and so on, sitting around the bar talking, it amazes me how many are uh, gaining, uh, how, how are lean towards Mr. Trump and the things he says. Uh, the reason for that is that they don't like the fact that their potential jobs, growth and increase in lifestyle is being drastically inhibited by the uh, influx of illegal people. These people are here legally, went through the proper process, uh, own their homes, uh, you know, live like we all do because we're American people, American citizens. Um, this is something you'll never hear from the media. Nobody's ever gonna come through and do a survey in my area because they don't really give a squat about us. And however, I do know that our counties consistently vote, and we have a very large Hispanic population, consistently vote conservative and have for years. Unfortunately, we live in the left coast of California. Uh, we're dominated by the, uh, and I'll just say it, the, the, the crap in Los Angeles and San Francisco, the people who, uh, you know, really don't have a touch in reality and are able to uh, enjoy a life a little different than those of us who work. So that's my rant for the morning. You will not hear this on the news. Um, I can, if you want, someday I'll do a man on the street video as I oft do, and I'll interview these people sitting around after looking at their green hands uh, from pulling olives off the trees. And I'll, of course, you have to be maybe be bilingual to listen to them. But uh, it's amazing to me that, see, the Hispanic culture is very conservative in its root base. And, mm -hmm. um, in our neighborhood, we have very conservative people who live here. They're family oriented. Uh, people are down at church on Sunday. They're down at church on Wednesday. Yeah, but you know, uh, uh, Chuck, you go to the Jehovah's Witness congregation. Yeah, go, yes, go on. Uh, good next. Right okay. Now. Yeah, you the, but Barack Obama in the last election won seventy one percent of the Latinos. So, and by the way, uh, Roxanne, it's twelve point six percent of the U.S. population is Afro American. Hmm. So, um, but that that's where I think uh, Trump, I mean, I agree that they there is a very conservative uh, strain in the Latino community. I'm involved with, a, you know, I am Latino. I have my family and friends and it just amazes me right. how they often vote. And, but they vote from a, oh, the ones I know often not a, a particularly... Uh, high degree of education you know they they vote with uh their heart not their minds and uh you know as do a lot of americans and since when did education ever become a factor of a person making a decision about the credibility of a human being because they don't know the facts uh, of those my human father beings. was an uneducated immigrant i'm basically uneducated many of my neighbors are yet we're we're totally capable of reading ciphering taking opinions and within our own minds and making well, a decision. You do that. And uh, you that, do that that's great. Well, yeah, and we do. People well, do that, yeah. Nick. The fallacy of the elitist, the fallacy of the academes, which I get a kick out of, uh, they, they look at people. I have a couple of degrees like yourself. I didn't get my PhD at Scripps because my business was growing so large I didn't have the time to finish it. But the, the, the interesting thing is that this, what we're just talking about, is supposedly the masses in the United States are a bunch of idiots, and they're not. And you'll see the results of this election prove itself a little different. Now, my son yeah, spent I, two days on the road driving uh, from Texas, actually, and I'm going to leave because he's here. Oh, sorry, Chuck. Um, what I was, That's okay. Well, I wanted to ask you, Chuck. <laughs> what I wanted to ask you, Chuck. So just to, uh, I just want to quickly summarize some of the points that you've tried to make and also ask you a quick question and then go on to with Nick. Um, but but also I want to bring Roxanne in because um, I'm interested in how she has her position been changed. But um, I think what you're what you're trying to say is that um, Mr. Trump um, is a populist, and you feel that he has touched a much broader base of the voter the possible voter, even outside the traditional GPO um, primary base. Would that be a good summary of your uh, initial position? Yes. 
Yes, um, but you have to realize that my opinions, Jonathan, are based on the you know backward, rural, uh, uneducated uh, place that I live. Okay. However, when we spent our our, our three weeks traveling across the United States, stopping yeah, uh, mid America, I just like to say something. We found the same. Thing. I just like to say something. I, I agree with you and Nick. I, I think what Nick, what he means by education is like what Jefferson and some of the founding fathers is that it's up to the citizen to educate themselves right. about the actual real core um, subjects and not just be influenced by personality and, and propaganda. But I don't exactly. think I don't think Nick is saying that you need to have a PhD or even a degree to be able to coherently be a part of the democratic system, Chuck. Well, I don't think he's saying that. Am I right about that? Um, Absolutely. It, yeah. Like, Chuck, obviously you have educated yourself and um, you you know about issues and you're an avid reader. Well, I'm talking about the people that aren't, and there's a lot. There's a lot. I run into so much ignorance uh, on and people that they have no idea who the assembly you live, is. You live in Southern California. You live <laughs> the high school graduate in Corning, California, is way beyond the education level of a of a, a, a what do you call it a, a junior college person in Southern California. Yeah, uh, I fly down to Southern California all the time, and we have a hard time hiring people who who can read and write and cipher. My gosh, it's terrible. Yes, anyway, yes, but, I saw... uh, Chuck, um, <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask you: um, it, Can you know it's a it's a complicated issue, education? It is. But um, is. you know, I don't think you can totally blame it on the students that are coming out of the system. Um, no, they they're poorly taught. Um, they're so poorly I would taught. like Roxanne. Um, so yeah, go on, Roxanne. The media knows where to find the people who live in trailers are backwards and that's who they interview. That's always it in North Carolina. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, why did they not come to someone, you know, that knows what they're saying that lives somewhere that uh, doesn't want to live in a trailer or knows better because there's not that many more like that now. I mean, they always find the person that just, Oh, it makes me mad that they do that. Yeah, um, I just want to respond to that, uh, Roxanne, because I, um, <laughs> you bring up a couple, and I oh, Nick's, Nick's gone. So if anybody else wants to no, join, I'm here. Uh, I would love, I, I would love a, a real hardcore Republican to join us, actually, because um, I love debate. So um, and I love for Rob Hicks to join us at <laughs> some time, yeah. uh, or chat. Uh, but I'd love a hardcore Republican to join us. Um, so um, my response to that, um, what you've just said, Roxanne, is, um, is I've, I've, I'm in my third year, the end of my third year as an American citizen, Roxanne, and what is slightly disappointing, I do understand it, that there seems to be a linkage of intelligence to wealth. Um, I've got to tell you, Roxanne, that uh, I've met a few people in northern Nevada who have inherited a lot of money from property, mineral rights, land rights. And there is a substantial minority that I know in this area that are extremely wealthy. They are some of the dumbest people I've ever met, Roxanne. You know, they are some of the most self-opinionated dumb individuals that I've ever come across. Um, you seem to be linking intellectual ability or intellectual insight into your financial or um, cultural position. And I, I just want to challenge you that because, uh, because, but I've noticed that in a lot of Americans, and I think this is one of the things that attracts Trump, Mr. Trump, to a lot of people. Roxanne is that he's successful. He has made a load of money. So he must be really clever and really right. So how do you respond to that, Roxanne? When I was going through school, I worked in the fragrance department at Belks. Well, we worked on commission. I was the only one that walked up 
and asked people that needed help that were in overalls, all dirty, didn't look like they needed, you know, had any money. Well, what did I do? I made the most commission off of them that I did, that other people did, walking up to the people in suits and ties. And here they'd buy the old toilet, you know, and here I would sell the 100% perfume, the powder, the lotion, all this stuff to the other people that looked the poorest. So I, they had the money and they wanted to spend it when they needed to. But I mean, they were, I don't want, I'm sorry, but they didn't know what they were doing. They didn't want to ask them. They thought they were the poorest. <laughs> I, no, I get your point. Um, I like to move the conversation on. So Nick, um, what do you, you know, you've said um, a few wow. bit like me on a bit like, me with Harry, you've said a lot of um, disparaging things about Mr. Trump. But what I'd like to ask you, Nick, um, why do you, what is it about Mr. Trump that's made him really popular in a sizable minority of the GPO and outside the GPO? Where, what buttons? GOP. What, yeah, G, <laughs> sorry, GPO, GP, yeah, blah, blah. Um, what, buttons do you think he's really effectively um pressing well <clears throat> uh the obvious ones bigotry race xenophobia i mean if the fear he's mongering you know and and saying ridiculous things i'm going to make the desert glow you know great he's he, he well, you're mixing the wrong that was um cruz that actually said that oh that was cruz yeah but they're i mean now they seem to be in bed together looks like they're gonna try and run together um they seem to be, um, you know, they never criticize each other anymore. And uh, it's almost as, as if that's the ticket that they're trying to uh, establish is the Trump ticket. And I think that Trump is pandering to fear and racism and bigotry. And uh, he's really exposed an uh, ugly underbelly of the American culture. A huge portion of people in the GOP are that obviously don't really care about the most important issues. They're worried that their town's going to have a, a, a terrorist attack when, you know, in, in the last uh, uh, two, three weeks, we lost 3,500 people to guns and they're, Oh no, no, we need more guns. You know, we need more, uh, all this stuff. You know, it's crazy. It, it's crazy. What the things he says about uh, he's race baiting, he's fear baiting. Uh, and, and that's, so to a certain uh, group. You, you would say that the core, and I, I'm going to bring you in, Roxanne, I'm just going to, so just to summarise, um, Dr. Nick, you would say that the core of his popularity um, is based on racial fear. Yeah, probably racial fear, Would you, that would sum it up. Yep. Yeah. So wh how, wh what do you, how do you respond to that, Roxanne? You don't have to have a licence for a shotgun. So you can just go and buy one from Walmart. So one of the changes could be just maybe now we have to get a license for a shotgun. That would help. Yeah. So, but what? Do, how do you respond to Dr. Nick's um, overall assessment of the popularity of Mr. Trump that is based on racial stereotyping and right, a racial racism? Or do you think his positions are there's a bit more? why he has become so popular i'm not sure if you could call it all racist he now i do think it's i just want to put this in i think it's crazy that he pulls up in his airplane and lets the people all see that i, I did i just want to mention that it's crazy but um just well, why, why do you think why, why do you think it's crazy i just laugh it's like, why? I don't need to see that. <laughs> I just want to hear what you have to say. I don't need to see it. Hey, I, I'm curious, you guys. What did you think about Trump when they did the Pledge of Allegiance for the debate last Tuesday? And everybody else on stage had their hand on their heart. And uh, he stood there with his hands at his side, just uh, looking as arrogant as I've ever seen a human being look as if he were above the whole thing. Did that register with you guys? 
Well, um, to respond, Nick, you know, um, I said it on last week's show, and I've had a um, exchange of emails with um, Bill, is that um, when you actually look at photographs and you look at old films, his, a lot of his gestures and mannerisms are like Mussolini. Um, and that's not totally disparaging, Nick, because... Um, <laughs> No, it isn't actually, and I want to explain that to to our audience and to you, Nick. Um, Mussolini was a very effective a, a communicator that managed to link corporate greed with a, a, a populist movement that became the Italian Fascist Party, and he managed to utilize corporate money with a proper a populist um, political movement that got him into power and sustained him in power. And he was, he was supposed to be a fantastic orator that could literally persuade anybody if they got... So I don't think Mr. Trump's oratory skills are up to Mussolini, but when you look at, look at the gestures... And to answer your question, yeah, I did see it, but I wasn't surprised because I think at the core of Mr. Trump's ideology is kind of semi-fascism, is semi-fascist. And um, it's a strange combination of really populist views, Nick, um, with obviously he he is crony capitalism. He He's made his money and he makes no bones about it. So it's a strange concoction. Um, how do you respond to that, Nick? Well, I agree with you. I, I completely agree with you. And I heard a newscast sometime, I forget which one it was, an interview with one of the pundits of um, uh, a Democratic, I forget the guy's name, but he also made the, exactly the same uh, comparison that you made. He said, and he used the name, he said, Trump looks like Mussolini. He's using Mussolini's game plan. He, he said exactly what you're saying. And I, uh, so I, I agree with you completely. Yes, but I, I I want to put this, and I'm going to ask Roxanne to comment on it, is that I think where I disagree with you, Nick, is that I feel that um, even, even though there's a lot of racism at the core of what Mr. Trump says, there are also genuine concerns about immigration, about the visa system, about... Um, how the supposedly 11 million illegal immigrants in this country are going to be dealt with. I can, um, but like there's also, but there's also, I think he really um, deals um, by his position on these trade agreements, and also he's com. Um, but also about the war. When it comes to war, he's tremendously contradictory. He attacks the entry of Iraq, of the war with Iraq. But on the same time, he says he wants to increase defence expenditure. So he's all over the place when it comes to that particular subject. But you wanted to say something about when I was talking about the 11 million illegal. What, what do you want yeah, to say about well, that? Well, we have a controlled porosity with our borders, Okay. You know, it would it would be not that difficult to really to sh to shut it down. But they, we need this workforce, and and who, uh, you know, uh, who's going to be picked doing the picking? Chuck's said he that all that a lot of his people were uh, American citizens. But if you, I also, you know, in California we have tons of people working. You know, I I do construction work at times, and I'm always hiring um, Mexicans, and. They none of them are citizens, and none of them are here legally. Okay, there's so the the everybody I know, including Trump, uses illegals. So there's a there's a porosity that's being allowed, you know, and uh, so when they say they're going to build a wall, or you know, there's they they could all they'd have to do really, it seems to me, is is a uh, uh, ramp up the funding on on the border. Uh, patrol and uh, would be able to stop a lot of it. So there, you know, that's what I, I wanted to say. And I know that there's huge numbers of illegals. By the way, do you know where the, the biggest, uh, this is a side note, the biggest population of Mexicans is in the United States? 
You'd think it'd be L.A. or San Diego. It's Did Chicago. You? Oh, I thought it was us. No, Chicago has the by, by far, by large, the far, the biggest uh, conglomeration, the biggest gathering of, of, of people living there that are Mexicans from Mexico. It's huge. Yeah. Anyway, that's just a um, little side I, note. I just want to ask Roxanne this. Um, my position is that we need, um, obviously, the 11 million supposedly are here. They, they should be some um, legal way of them becoming legal citizens. Um, but I think they must accept that they must pay fines and they must accept that the, what they fundamentally did was illegal. Um but there should be a clear path. I also think after that, it should become extremely illegal to hire illegal immigrants that enter this country if you're an employer. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you should face prison sentences to hire illegal immigrants in this country. And, um, and to finish off my three-part question, you know, I, I don't know if you agree with what I've just said, Roxanne, but also, um, have you been surprised at the lack of traction that Rand Paul has managed to get in the Republican campaign so far? Well, let's start from the beginning. Um, one thing I think is we as Americans won't take a pay cut to be able to find employment probably as low as Hispanics, they get the job. It's one thing. And another thing, I don't know about being put in jail if you hire them, maybe just a real steep fine. And what I, I mean, if you continue, continuously break the law in the well, end, fine, there must be a final penalty. And yeah. I consider that you end up in prison. Well, was, you know, you keep getting checked and. Do you have any they, idea? Hmm. What? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. I, I was just going to say, do you have any idea how many businesses would shut down if you right. did that? I mean, across across the country. Well, I mean, how many restaurants yeah. and hospitals? You know, I'm and sorry to um, interrupt, Roxanne. But I'll get back. I just want to respond to Doctor Nick's point there. Well, I do know what would happen, Nick. Um, wages would go up. Actually, mm -hmm. um, actually, this is the problem of, of the traditional left. It won't deal with this issue. And this is why populists like Mr. Trump get traction, because we want to be blind. But the reason why working class men and women are fine, one of the reasons, not solely, but one of the reasons why they, you know, their wages are under pressure is because of all these illegal immigrants and they are prepared to do jobs work at a lower a non-union rate a non um survivable a decent living standard rate they're prepared to do that work i'm not attacking them for that nick but it's just a fact of life nick yeah, and i'm not uh you know i'm looking at the the different statements here on the side i'm not uh in favor of you know I, there should be a program a work program that is much stronger than what we've got now and you know i don't think it's a healthy thing to have the the porous borders but it you know i'm not controlling the borders somebody else is and it's been this way for a long time through a lot of different administrations and it's not like you know they they close off borders in europe we can close our borders but we don't it's it's a somebody's making a decision that says we have it, it's there's a certain porosity and it's been stayed the same you know, you, yeah, I, I totally disagree with your position, Nick. I, I feel that we definitely don't need to build borders and walls and end up like. Um, but what we do need is we need to track people down that hire illegal immigrants and highly fine them and consistently make it very unattractive to hire these people and have a system that regularly f finds these people. So you uh, anybody considering hiring illegal people just won't do it well, because the chances have been fined and ending up in prison if you don't pay the fines or you keep doing it is extremely high well let's uh start with trump who it, they, the other day was it was alleged he has over 1100 illegal aliens working for him so let's start let's start there 
you know, I'm not in favor of all that. Uh, you know, I, 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 it's, it's crazy. They're everywhere though. They're just everywhere. And I see them. I see people from, um, I I've known, uh, uh, waitresses for instance, that are from, um, uh, the Czech Republic, the old Czech or, or Croatia, like that, and they're here illegally. They they got in legally, and overstayed their visas, and this just melt into the culture. Yeah, they do. And and they're everywhere. Uh, they're from, from somebody, all over the place. As somebody that went through the legal system, it really upsets me that that these people are doing this. Um, so Roxanne, what? what um, What's your what's your position on what I've just said, and also why um, Paul Ran has really got no real traction in the Republican um, prior? You know, it looks like he's going to get absolutely no traction. It, you know, w are you surprised by that or not? Or um, well, I wanted to say, how many Hispanics do you have working for you, Nick? Oh, I none none right oh, now. You know, I it, it, like every. Yeah, I don't. I have no. Uh, oh, every once in a while, you know, I'll I'll uh, do a a job for somebody. They, you know, they'll I I can do uh, custom tile work, and they want something artistic. So, you know, and I'll go to a corner where there's a bunch of you know by Home Depot or somewhere, and hire somebody for a day or two. Okay. You know, it's not. Uh, you know, and that I always ask, where are you from? And there are uh, a lot of Mexicans uh, from all over Central and South America, El Salvador. You know, they're from everywhere. And uh, so it's not like a like something I do regularly or, you know, hire for – it's usually sometimes a half a day. You know, okay. I need a ditch dug or I need some bunch of trash picked up or, you know, something like that. Yeah, I, I'm going to say something that's going to surprise a lot of people probably listening to this blab because um, – I actually think it's absolutely right for people to um, to be challenged and asked for their driving license. And I, um, I actually think if you can't provide documentation to prove that you're legally here, um, you, you should be asked to leave the country. Um, that done politely um, and with humanity. But you're a illegal immigrant in this country and you should be told to leave. I even think you need to they need to ask for voter registration cards. Um oh thanks. Um so we've got a new guest. Um I, I just wanted to jump in for for a second. I've been listening for a while and I just wanted to say that it bothers me when the emphasis seems to always be put on the people. This whole conversation of immigration, not just here, but on um on the news and stuff is always pointing towards the people people who are just looking for jobs historically people will do whatever it is that they need to do to make money to take care of their families now i don't agree with this policy but if the idea is to end the uh illegal issue it's very simple like i, I said earlier a um a fine of one thousand dollars per day, <clears throat> per person, would end it. Because Tyson Chicken, uh, was it Tyson Foods, couldn't afford that kind of fine. And, and it's really a lot, a lot of times it's these larger corporations that do that. And don't get me wrong, Nick, um, I understand needing people to do cheaper work, but like if you were facing a fine of $1,000 per day per person, you probably wouldn't pick up illegals at- Oh, no, absolutely. 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 Like I said, don't get me wrong. I, I understand and, why you're doing And it. when I do hire these, these people, I usually pay them like about five bucks more than the going rate. Right. And I buy lunches and I don't, you know, I don't use slave labor at all, you know, and I'm very conscious about, uh, you know, health and, and, and treating the people with dignity and giving them fair wages, you know, and, uh, it was, I don't know where I can go pick up, uh, a non, um, immigrant, you know, a legal immigrant for uh, like a half a day. I don't know where to go do that. Right. And, you know, I, I would, you know, Chuck just said that uh, his people were all, uh, if he's an aggro, Chuck, you got to know that there's just millions of illegal uh, wor illegals working in the fields. I mean, I, I so, and, and those, those 
poor folks are coming here, you know, escaping political and poverty, you know. I uh, just want to just want to intervene, Nick, because Rob, um, he says, um, I like your response. He says, "Ho, Nick, you're such a compassionate lawbreaker." <laughs> you know, I have been most of my life. <laughs> what I'd say about Rob I mean, is, I'm an old it's about, hippie. It's about time that you came on and actually uh, let us. Um, so, um, hi, yeah. What, what's your it's, name? You just call me Yella. Yella. Um, so, Yella, are we just to get? What's your thoughts about Mr. Trump? Do you think he has touched some real populist buttons in the consciousness of the voter? Uh, yeah, some of the the darkest, um, most uh, the, the things about our our populism that should be pushed to the side and 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 ignored. I think it's the worst of who we are is what he's tapping into, and um, I think that that's sad. But it has definitely opened up to my eyes the to the extent of what of of how that exists. Uh, in our country, uh, for those who thought that the uh, thought that this was just a minority uh, group of people in our country, no, it's it's not. There's a lot of people that that don't care about facts, don't care about uh, true information, um, and that are more than willing to get caught up in, uh, in forms of bigotry when it comes to. Um, uh, their political stance and stuff like that. It's really sad. Yeah, yeah I'd like to ask thing, you. Uh, yeah, another I, thing is that yeah. um, we all honor these people like Martin Luther King and Gandhi and uh, for those that are Christian, Jesus Christ. One of the reasons I say that this is not a Christian nation because if it was a Christian nation, it would act more like Jesus. However, um, we all honor these people, but when it comes to our leaders, we have no problems when these people obviously advocate points of view that are counter to that you know uh you would think that uh, a stance of being powerful but acting in a peaceful way would be more effective but you have people like trump and stuff that are let's blow them up you know let's let's kill more you know which is sad to say the least. yeah yeah, but um, I, I agree with you, um, Yella, but um, there must be also, he must be also touching some economical, some deep-seated deep concerns, and he must be doing it effectively. Have you got any, personally, you got any other insights of what he's touching with, with the consciousness of that, of that voter? Um, you know, he... he... He seems to be saying a lot of the, the the right things as far as well, and and actually he's not. He keeps just saying, um, "I'm going to get this country running again," and we're just supposed to trust that because he is uh, involved in building, and you know he's a big builder of of uh, you know Trump towers and all that. Oh, this guy can definitely build a wall. He's built the Trump towers and all that kind of stuff, <laughs> and. He's just saying that stuff. He doesn't seem to have any plans. He's just saying these things. Oh, I'm going to be the best builder. I'm going to get the economy running again. But I'm with, tough. with no plans. I, I'm the great leader. Yeah. I'm the great Trust Duce. Me. Trust I'm that's, the great Duce. That's worked um, out so well uh, throughout history. Just trust me, you know. Okay, well, yeah, let's just trust you and hope that everything works out. <laughs> Yeah, I also want to put this to you. Um, my insight about it is that he's made a load of money, you know, and there's debates about how much real capital he's really got. You know, he's produced tax statements, what, blah, blah, blah. And I was also interested in why that was so important. He felt it was really important to prove his wealth at the present moment. Is it is a lot of his credibility? Do you feel around American psyche that um, to have a voice, effective voice, you have got to have a load of money? And if you haven't got a load of money, you're not you're not somebody that should be listened to. Do you think that's also part of the thing that he appeals to a lot of voters? Oh, this is America, and we're impressed by money. We're far more impressed by people who make lots of money than people who spend their lives doing uh, great deeds, you know. 
Um, so it, people see all that money that he's got, and well, he must he must be uh, he must be a go getter. Um, yeah, I uh, you know, yellow. I'm an artist. I'm a sculptor, and um, I spent a lot of years being a starving artist, mm -hmm. and then after a while, I had some fairly, you know, some major successes. I've won several international medals, you know, things, and suddenly I'm on the map as an artist. But before that, people would ask, you know, what do you do? What's your occupation? I'd say uh, an artist, and they would look at me like, well, but no, really, what do you do? No, seriously, you're an artist. I mean, how do you how do you make a living? How do you, you know, and and in Europe, <laughs> I was treated like a king. Well, as soon as they found out that I was an artist, they they'd come out in restaurants and sing and dance and give us drinks and food. And you know, it, it, being an artist in Europe, it was a completely different animal than being an artist here because here it's about. Um, what kind of car do you drive? What, you know, how much money do you have? You know, that was the most important thing that anybody ever seemed, you know, it's like a cultural void here. Well, in America, to say it. you're a good artist if you're pulling in the big money, you know, that's the only, that's the only measure. Yeah. They don't, and they'll, they'll never even ask what medium do you do? Are you a painter? Are you a dancer? Are you a, is, you know, what, what, what do you do? Are you a poet? You know, they, none of that matters. You know? Yeah, I've, I think it was a point because obviously I just want to live a moderate life and be have the freedom to do what I want to do as a self-employed entrepreneur, and I've always done that in my life. Um, so, but um, I do think at the core why Trump, you know, gives him the freedom to finance this campaign and gives him the freedom to say what he wants without worrying about sponsors because or backers because he doesn't need them. So he has the freedom to say whatever he wants. But also, I, I think this position gives him more credibility that, than he really deserves because yeah. um, uh, I've known a lot of idiots that have had a ton of money and they couldn't put two coherent thoughts together to save their life. Um, so I would... um, so uh, 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 it does kind of puzzle me, but I do understand it because... Um, so I'd like, um, I like to ask the panel, um, Nick, um, Rand Paul has really had really no traction um, in the Republican... Um, have you been surprised by his total... Inability to get any traction, even though you know, look, the Libertarian, the Tea Party was a quite strong movement, and his father was um, almost the kind of the love boy of the movement. But he's got nowhere. We got any reflections on why that is? Yeah, you're talking to me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I. It's a puzzle to me, and no, I don't understand it because I really like the things he says. Of all the candidates up there, he's the only one to me that seems sane. Um, I, I just think, uh, and you know, he goes against the grain, but there you have it. That's uh, the party, the, the the bulk of the party is, which these are a, a big swatch of Americans, uh, go, are, are uh, backing Trump. I mean, it's an, to me, it's ugly. It's um, ignorant. I, I, it, it's, hurt it just hurts our image around the world <clears throat> people are laughing at us all over the place because of trump yeah and do you do you think rand's uh, rand's ball inability to get any traction in the polls or is also that a lot of the oxygen has been sucked up by mr trump and Cruz? i i don't know i really don't understand that i don't you know i don't understand the dynamics of what's going on there i just don't yeah I don't. That's why I'm asking. Uh, what about Roxanne? Have you got any thoughts why Rand Paul has really got absolutely no traction at all? Well, I, see. I don't know what everybody else thinks about people being voted in Congress and they don't do their job and head back to Washington when there's time to vote. But that bothers me. But he was too busy traveling and trying to get 
voters and help with raising money. So that's the only thing that was bothering me. That other than that, that's all I was able to pick out. Didn't he get one state that was following him? Only one. Are well, you talking about Rand Paul? Yeah. Didn't he get one? I don't know. I'm not sure. I just thought I heard he had oh. one state following him. All right, all right. What about you, Yella? Um, have you got any reflections on Rand Paul and why the tea, you know, his normal base that, that seemed for his father very, very vocal, uh, really has disappeared in this particular Republican cycle, and he, he's really been marginalised, hasn't he? Uh, yeah, I think that it, it's very simple: is that um, his uh, lack of support for our country being involved in endless wars all over the world is why he gets no traction in the Republican party. You know, that's if, if you want to run in the Republican party and not win, uh, say that you don't support <laughs> going to war. And it's as simple yeah. as that, you know, that's he, he, has, he has a logical, um, uh, uh, opinion about how America should be seen, uh, in the world as far as our military goes. And, um, that is not the feeling of most Republicans. I, I talked to a lot of people and, and they're so quick to, we need to get our military in there. We need to get our military in there. Uh, great. Hey, uh, gang, I'm going to step out for just a moment. Yeah, to sure. me a chance. I'll be right back. Can I That'd be up? great. Go on. Uh, go on. Sorry, Roxanne. Go on. I just want to bring up one thing. Um, talking about healthcare and, yeah. you know, they're not talking about that much. And, with everybody not agreeing with Obamacare, I just wonder why, you know, it's just they're not talking about health care anymore. Uh, I think that's them. a really interest I think that's a really interesting point, Roxanne, because it was a major it was still a major discussion. And so yeah, you know, you got any thoughts why you know it's been strange, isn't it? Because they were the the Republican Party were constantly going on about Obamacare, mm -hmm. and then it, in some ways it's it's still there, but it's not the drumbeat has died down a little bit to some mm -hmm. extent. I don't know if you would agree with that. And, and why don't you think it's more of still a bigger subject? Well, here's why I think. Okay. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead, Roxanne. Shall Yellow? Go ahead. Go, go on, Yellow. Yellow. Uh, I think that part of what it is, even though I was someone who supported uh, some sort of national health care, even though I think what we got was kind of kind of crappy, but I'd rather have one foot in the direction than no feet in the direction and going backwards. But I think what happened is people like me who tried to get Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, insurance on the, you know, the individual market, I went and called up Blue Cross Blue Shield and tried to get insured and it cost me a little over $300 a month. That's what their quote was. Oh, of course I hung up the phone and I didn't get insurance because I can't afford $300 a month. And then with the, uh, once Obamacare went in, I called in and tried to, to see what the prices were gonna be. And it was like a hundred and, uh, was it 120 something bucks? I can't remember, it was a while back. Um, and at that point, I was like, okay, that's that's not that bad, and um, I still didn't get it because I, oh. I was oh. like, one hundred twenty oh. bucks is a lot of money. I'm young and healthy. I'm not going to worry about it right now. But the business that I work for, um, because of the you know for the requirement, they have insurance now, and uh, my copay is like thirty two something dollars uh, oh. a week out of my paycheck. So I was like, okay, I'll take that. So I think what happened is a lot of people. Uh, they saw savings and they were like, okay, well, this isn't such a, you know, they don't love it. If you ask them about it, they'll hate it, you know, but these are the same people that say, you know, keep the government off my Medicare, you yeah. know? So <laughs> when, when, when people are making arguments like that, it's hard to take them seriously when they talk about their disgust for Obamacare, especially. Yeah, it's, a, it's a great point. Yeah. Yeah. So because um, I think um, Dr. Nick was pointing that out. That's around education. And when somebody's saying, and I've had that myself, when somebody, um, especially in Northern Nevada, because there's a lot of retired state workers, um, federal workers in Northern uh, 
in northern Nevada because of the state capitals in Carson City. And um, I've had um, in the Republican Party this substantial vo vocal element that um, is against um, um, subsidies, blah, blah. And these people are on state pensions, um, full medical care. Mm -hmm. You know, they never had a, they never done a day's work in the, in the private sector. They've always worked for state government mm -hmm. or federal government. And it just, it just cracks me up. Um, mm -hmm. It just makes, they come out with this, these, one-liners that you've just met and you just think what world do you live in you know what planet do you live in you know um wake up <laughs> but i think it's really you know it's really quite contagious just to be in the dream world of your own making really is and i think a lot of times because of the, the emphasis and the way that the media um reports things um and our inability to research everything, you know, at some point people just have to take it on, you know, what, what is being said to them and no, no disrespect, Roxanne, I'm in no way attacking you or anything like that, but your, um, your view about the population of uh, black people, uh, in this country is, I, I completely understand why you seem perplexed when the actual number did come up. Mm -hmm. Uh, when when someone gave you the actual numbers, because stories are not represented uh, properly. You know, I had a buddy uh, who actually thought more black people were on welfare than white people, and I was like, dude, that doesn't even make sense based on the numbers. And we got on the internet and looked at looked at what what the numbers were, and yes, there are far more white people. Matter of fact, if you take Hispanics and um and black people and all minority groups and group them together there's still slightly more white people who are on welfare and that's just based on the numbers however if you listen to fox news you would think that all people that are on welfare are black and that they are gaming the system now i know personally because my adopted mother was on welfare a white woman who was divorced and her ma her husband was the person that paid all the bills and all that kind of stuff. So she was on welfare for a little bit. Now, she used that system to get her education. And she works as a public relations officer. Well, not anymore, but she did work as a public relations officer for, um, for AIG for many years. Very good job. Uh, and she pulled herself out of it. And I think that those kind of stories are not represented yeah. on the news. I think... I, I, think I think you, you make, make uh, a really fantastic point there, actually. Um, uh, I do. I, I was surprised, Roxanne, when you did say that, but also I do understand why you said it because if you, what Yelta has pointed out is if you do watch the media, not only Fox yeah. Yelta, but um, all media, you would get the impression mm -hmm. that the black population was much, much higher. Um, and because I it's the way they it. talk, of, the way they talk about it. But mm -hmm. I also, I'm going to say something to you, Elta. I don't believe in welfare. I don't believe in subsidies, Elta. I believe that if a citizen cannot find a job, it's up to us and the state to find them a decent job. That um, There's plenty of work to be done um, in the community. And if somebody's trying and they can't find a job, we provide them a job. And if they want to go to college and retrain themselves, we help them out. It's called giving people a lifting hand. It's about... Not, Teach them to fish. Don't give them a fish. Yeah, it's about help. You know, you you've had a tough break. You know, you you're trying to find a job and you can't find one. We're going to help you out. You know, going to retrain you or provide you. I'm totally again. I've seen it in Britain, um, how it corroded to some regions and areas where everybody ended up on welfare, um, because they shut sh sh shut all the factories down all the legitimate ways of making a living. And I'm totally, and it made them wardens of the state. It took away their respect and took away their freedom in a way. Yeah, but in the, would... the way that Yella was talking about his mom, there is a need for a safety net. 
yeah. uh, at and for a lot of people at you know uh, uh, that you know I I know when I was a kid my mom got divorced and uh for a spell she had to you know get some help and then you know completely got herself out of it and uh but there are there are times you know and, and I do a lot of work for, at, at our homeless shelter in Laguna Beach not a lot I occasionally go out and feed them and ha- and you know I've been there quite a few times a lot of those folks they can't they they'll never get into the job market yeah. they're never getting so what do you do shoot them let them let them you know starve to death i mean they they are really damaged folks some of them yeah yeah really I, I, I just folks. want to clarify a bit because i was making broad statements you know obviously the mentally ill those that are of a state you know i'm not saying dismantle but of a system i think um it's much better those that can take up the opportunities that the state does offer real really quality employment in the community helping different projects and also offer training um, really quality training through community colleges and for that fin- and help people financially to take up that training um, and uh, I, I just would like to see a system that offered more help and more a broader s- scope of things to help people rather than just demonizing um, people all the time that they um, and demanding that they go and work for people for wages that they can't sustain themselves. Yeah, I would say that um, welfare goes hand in hand with job training and education. And um, because, <clears throat> like Dr. Nick was saying, there are times when when things happen that are immediate and they're bad, and someone needs to come in to the rescue. But once that has been taken care of, there needs to be a push towards. Okay, now that we have fed you, what can we do to make you whole? Uh, what what was your job? Okay. Well, that job doesn't exist anymore, but we can help you out with job training towards this career. And another thing that needs to change, God knows it needs to change. I'm an electrician. A lot of people look at me. They're like, oh, you're a licensed electrician. You must make good money. No, I don't. Uh, middle class workers, people, the build, what I call the, the builder class in this country is, is year by year by year getting screwed out of um, the value uh, of our work. And that I, I'm not an economist. I can't tell you you why that is, but I do know that I'm probably paid about ten thousand dollars less than what I should be if you base it off of. I think it's called the CPI. Um, yeah, I, I can tell you now why that's happened, and I'm sure Dr. Nick would uh, hopefully support me because when you and this is at the heart of Bernie Sanders' intellectual argument is that for the the past twenty years, Yelly. Yeah, you as a trained electrician, your wages have have just gone up by 2%. Over the past 20 years, your wage level has gone up by 2%. But I can tell you in certain key areas, inflation, rent, um, education, health, they haven't kept at 2%. And where, where most of the real... Um, increases in wealth have just gone to the one percent and that's why you're struggling yeah yeah 52 percent 52 percent of the income in the last 20 years has gone to the one percent 52 percent of the in of the profits that that this country makes has gone but it's worldwide actually has gone to the one percent so and i'm a plumber yella i uh did high-rise construction for a long time and I started out, the unions were strong, and I started out with making prevailing wage, which Ooh. was huge. We were we were living just fine. And, you know, the building, tr- the trades were booming. And then along came Reagan, and uh, basically he and his crew s- started the end of unions. And now there's really terrible training. You know, I had to do an apprenticeship, a five-year apprenticeship. And now there's, there's really – you know, I can't find, it's hard to find decent plumbers or decent electricians these days because so much of the training that the unions did, nobody else did it. The unions did it. And now, uh, 
it's all going downhill. Yeah. yeah so what do what do you feel, Yellow? I, I've just put an uh, intellectual argument. Do you think there was any substance in what I just said about why yeah. you, why you're you're not feeling fantastic about your economic situation? I, I completely uh, see that. That that makes sense, and I'm sure that there's more uh, numbers to to be dug out as far as that goes. Um, yeah. And I wouldn't blame. Uh, the owner of my company. I love the owner of my company, and and I'm not saying that figuratively. That I might the owner of my company is is awesome. He's a really great guy, and I think that probably he's also getting screwed by a system that makes his job uh, very difficult. Which, by the way, I wanted to mention that these 20 years that you're talking about, 20, 30 years, um, my job has gotten more complicated. It hasn't gotten easier. The amount of work that I have to do and the amount of things that I have to know are a lot more. Uh, I was looking over there to see if my, my code book was out because I was going to bring it over here to show you how thick it is. <laughs> my code book looks like a, a phone book, whereas in the 80s, that thing was like that thin. You know, yep. you, could, you could read it easily in a, in a, probably in less than a day. I'd love to yeah. see someone sit down yeah. and read a code book in a day. Yeah, I like to. I like to ask Ro- Roxanne. Do you um, do you think the, this underlying ec- economical dis- disaffection is one of the things that's really driving people to to look at Trump and people like Trump because they are deeply. But he also he he, he voices that dis- economic deep economic discontent but he also links it to a lot of racism and that really appeals to a certain element of the voter class would you agree with that Roxanne yeah and um well I just want to say one thing that I thought was funny you talked about um social security um he one time when he was talking he said that somebody asked him about social security because he had um he was worth so much, would he even need it? And he said he had to pause and think, well, no, I'll turn it down because I don't need it. And then they said, well, what about other people that are worth, have their millionaires? He said, well, they need it. Would you be able to not give it to them or offer it? He said, well, I'll ask them if they don't take it. <laughs> and I thought that was funny. But um, I don't think I'll get Social Security. Um, but uh, I just wanted to say that. But I wanted to bring up health. Can I bring up health and insurance? Yeah, sure. Okay, I'm yeah. sorry. I just I've been waiting, and I wanted to talk about that. Yeah, sure. Um, with how much it costs a month, that I have to include how much medication costs. Yes, because people that don't have to be on it don't have to worry how much they pay a month. Well, me, yes. You have to think about people. I take, gosh. I take four a month for my epilepsy. One of them without insurance would be $3,000 a month. That's just one of them. Yes. See, people don't know that. It's $3,000 a month. And um, I have to take name brand. There's a name brand and generic. The generic does not help my epilepsy. So my insurance turned it down. So I had to fight to get it. Here goes my voice. I had to fight to get it. I had to talk to the insurance company. I had to talk to the makers of the medicine. And I fought. I wrote a letter to Virginia Fox. She read it on the ground floor of the Congress. I mean, I fight for these things. So finally, I'm on all brand brand name. But every time anything happens with my insurance, I have to have a letter from my doctor saying I need to be approved. <laughs> it's just a pain to have to go through all that. Yeah, um, Roxanne, um, you've, you have, you bring up some fantastic points based on your personal experience, and you have expressed these before. But it's also, you're totally right, Roxanne. Um, it's not really been, I'm not even sure Bernie, I think Bernie had, you know, this whole, the, the average American's really been taken to the cleaners on their health care. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, Big time. they're they're being screwed left, right, and oh, yeah. sorry to use the term, folks, um, but I they're being screwed. 
screwed yeah, good and right. proper. Um, <laughs> and what's been amazing is that Americans will put up with with this system. <laughs> with this Not me. System. We need single payer. <laughs> Not um, me. You know, I think well, I think we I think we I, I have to go, but I just wanted to say I think that we put up with a lot of stuff that makes no sense. And not only that, but after we've already learned the lesson, we go back and make the same mistakes. And I will end it with saying the war on drugs. Oh, yeah. You cannot oh. win the war on drugs. It's impossible. Basic supply and demand dictates that you cannot win this war. But a combination between the federal government, state and local comes out to 40 something billion dollars a year to fight a war that will not be won. And it comes out of your paycheck. It comes out of, uh, uh, it comes out of the lack of roads. It comes out of the lack of infrastructure. And until we start making laws and legislation that's based on facts, as opposed to people's opinions, we will com- continue to be taken to the cleaners. Oh, thank you for making that point, Elta. And um, thanks for coming on the show. You've really, um, your points have been fantastic and you've added some real good insight. And I, I've seen, I've, I've seen a, a Nick before and I've seen Jonathan before. I'm following you. It was nice talking to you as well. Oh, good to follow you. Um, we're here every, um, we start roughly at 10 o'clock on every Sunday, Elta. So if you publicize it for us, and um, we join us we, again, please. And please join us again because you've made some great points. Okay, thanks for having me. You okay, guys have what, a great Sunday. One last thing I'd like to say, Yella, is this program, we're at the beginning and we're going to be expanding and we're just uh, in, informing how we're going to do this. So we plan to make this a much um, more successful venture here so please join us oh for sure i love to talk politics especially with people that uh, are are kind and respectful well there's <laughs> i love i love having argument you know obviously I, I get i think you're like me you have a broad base of different views um but i love getting really hardcore republicans on because i love debating <laughs> with them right. i just love i just love it uh see uh Roseanne is just too nice. She's too mild. <laughs> I like I like I like and read wild. And uh, Bill just can't believe it, but I love it. I love getting them on. Um, I love to get Rob Hicks on. So I'm gonna drop you out, yeah, but join yeah, us you, next sir. week if you can. Bye bye. And I'm just a guest, so <laughs> I'm not here all the time. <laughs> All right. Yeah, um, so I, love, I, love Rob, I love Rob to come on, but he just will not come on. But I'm just, I'm just, sal- sal- just salivating here. Oh, you said it in a minute. Uh, I'm just salivating at the prospect of finishing <laughs> the need- show off. With, <laughs> um, so, um, so, um, Doctor Nick, um, you know the healthcare system. Do you, you know? What's your reflection on what Bernie's been saying about the healthcare system, and what is the vision of the Bernie Sanders campaign um, around healthcare? Well, uh, it's exactly what I've been screaming since the '60s, and you know, of course, it, it's only it still hasn't gained the traction that I'd like it to, and that is we need single payer, like other civilized countries other modern countries. We need to do that. I've spent plenty of time in other countries where they have uh, single payer and the people are really, they're relaxed. Do you know, there, there's, there's a, an easier feeling. People here are afraid, you know, unless you have a lot of money, they're afraid to go to the uh, hospital and they end up in the emergency room with a much worse situation than if they'd have had preventative care. And they don't get that care here because of, of the cost and the big, you know, the medicines you talk about, Roxanne. I wonder if um, if it costs three thousand dollars in Europe or in China for that same medicine. I'll bet it's like, you know, thirty dollars. So I mean, big pharma, look what they've done, and they're constantly doing it. I mean, there. I, I wonder what that would would cost in Canada, you know, um, and and on the health care issue, why is it? With if, if if like the Republicans say we have the best uh, uh, health care in the world, oh, it's it, as... it does does uh, oh hey Rob, excellent. Why do they? Uh, um, hey. Why does uh, Cuba have a longer lifespan than the United States? 
Okay. I mean, and, and because everything is free there, uh, they can also go there. You know, they're, they're, they're much poorer country, obviously, but because of that healthcare, they live longer than we do, you know, by like six years. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy how, uh, this, this system. And when Bernie was talking about it, you know, people are saying like, I've heard Bill say this, Oh, Bernie wants to give everything away. But the truth is, if we had single payer health care, uh, it would be much cheaper than what we've got now. Much cheaper on, uh, for each of the individuals. And because what we, we would have to do, of course, is tax the one percent and tax the corporations. And that would pay more than pay for the health care and um you know, and, and of course, get insurance companies out of the loop. But boy, the that's the, the Republicans just don't want to hear anything about that. And the, then the insurance companies are going to be paying billions to make sure that that doesn't happen. So that's that's my take. Yeah. We need single payer health care. Right. So, Rob, um, what's your view about the health care situation in America and how would you know, do you I, I'd like, I'd like another I'd like another industry example where having a single payer or, or single industry anything. Uh, is optimal, whether whether it's ships, roads, buildings, whatever. I mean, to have that argument of a single payer anything or single, you know, a monopoly on anything makes sense. That's ridiculous. I mean, we had this kind of debate yesterday or last week about uh, about healthcare and who is the best. I mean, the, the best is, is is being defined by 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 those that are not the best trying to be the best, and it's competition. I mean, competition is what is what drives innovation. It's what what drives exceptional exceptionalism, and it's what drives prices down. So having a single um, payer system so is ridiculous. Why are prices so high for medical services here, and why are the medicines so high here? That competition hasn't helped a bit in driving the cost down. Yeah, competition in quotes. It's not competition. I mean, I can't I can't buy an insurance policy across state. I can only buy the ones that the state of Maryland has has defined for me on my behalf. But I, I can't. I don't. I can't shop around. That's not competition. The yeah, um, yeah. I, I just. Uh, it's a difficult position, Rob, because I don't. I, I mean, uh, I don't. I, I absolutely agree with Nick. In some ways, I agree with you, Rob. Actually, you'd be probably surprised by that. Um, but I just, I, I just want to put some of the negatives to your argument, and then if we continue, I might put some of the why I think you're not totally wrong. Um, the only I do hear that argument, Rob. Um, but you know, we have centralised education. We have centralised fire departments. We have police department. We decide as a society there's certain functions that we're not going to put out to the private sector, um, and we've chosen those decisions for various factors. So to put the intellectual argument that the free en whatever free enterprise is, which I don't really think exists, so we've got a place um, to work. is is the solver of all problems. I do challenge you on that basic <laughs> philosophy. Okay. okay, but that but even that it's it's like I mean you see our own president smashing and bashing police departments across the United across the United States because they're racially profiling. This is the government, uh, you know, in, in its grandiose spectacle and. The, the president himself is, is saying how awful it is. So, you know, he, I don't know how you're using that as, as, as an argument that because we only have one police department, uh, uh, that that's an, an ideal version of success. I mean, it's just simply not. You know, m most 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 sheriffs in, in, in conservative towns will tell you, you know, that, that the public at large is better off arming themselves. Uh, that's, that's, that's just, that's I, just I, a I fact. I disagree. Well, I um, disagree with it, but that is what they're saying. I mean, you look at, at Sheriff uh, um, Arpaio, at, at Sheriff Clark, or well, of, course, of course Arpaio, but I mean, but, uh, <laughs> Sheriff Clark, uh, you know. Uh, um, yeah. No, I agree. That's what they're saying. I just agree with that <clears throat> idea is what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like to say again, Nick um, and Rob, um, I, I'm not actually totally against guns, actually, Rob. Um, um, a lot of people that are, are friends of mine are totally against gun ownership. I'm not. I actually think um, you've got every right to own a gun if you want to. Um, but I think also that right comes really very strong responsibilities. Absolutely. And, and so does free speech. So does free speech. I mean, you're right. Uh, you know, I mean, 
being an adult requires responsibility. So that, yeah. so that, that to caveat that kind of statement is is is, is kind of like. Yeah, but I just want to put some specific uh, things. Um, I think that anybody that wants to own a gun um, should it be a, a member of a gun club. Um, I think the um, officers of that gun club should have training and have responsibilities to supervise their membership. Um, I think when members are obviously having problems with their attitude towards guns and are saying, I think the officers of that club have the duty to kind of warn that member. And if you're not a member of a gun club, you should lose your license to own a gun. So um, I don't want a government, as you would put it, controlled system, but I want a community-based system that keeps um, its membership under um, some kind of supervision. And there's a form, there's a platform of supervision. Well, would you be totally against that? Yeah, well, I mean, I just, I, yeah, well, yeah, I, of course I would. Because on one hand, you're saying, that you that you support a system where you have to be a part of a club. Well, but you didn't. But you didn't even quantify that other than just say it's a club. So what if it's a club of terrorists? Well, Roxanne, I mean, what do you say about that? They're, they're a club, so we got to let them in, regardless of the fact that they're felons and convicts and stuff like that. They're a club, so thus the, the person owns. That that's a ridiculous argument. Um, I think you're. Roxanne. Be, I think you're being slightly facetious there, yes. actually, Rob. Because obviously, I mean, I'm, I'm using I, good I, confines. Uh, you're saying that a club ha the, the club is the requirement that it shouldn't be the government, but it should be a government that ordains the club to allow the individual to have the rights. And, and, and I say that's it's 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 ridiculous across the board because the discussion is is what's the point of having the discussion? It, it's a right. The you know the Constitution doesn't. Didn't lay out the fact that I needed to be a part of a gun club. Well, it, it does yeah. say it does say in the wording that you should be part of a regulated militia. Well regulated. You're militia. Mis yeah, well you're mis regulated. You're, yeah, you're the taking. The powers fully understood what what the importance of, of owning a firearm was, and it wasn't to, to do deer hunting. No, I totally disagree with you there. Hey, what, 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 Roxanne, Ro Roxanne had something to say. What? What? Yeah, go what, on, Roxanne. Well, I was going to say what kind of gun club, <laughs> but. I have been wanting to ask you about the UK and their medicine because, the, you know, <laughs> and ca and Canada because you don't get to pick which doctor you don't you want to go to, and I know people in the UK that I've talked to about their drugs, they are getting expensive too, and uh, it's getting ridiculous over there. So. Oh. Yeah, thank you so much, because this is where I do agree with Rob to some extent. Um, and, uh, you know, um, but I also agree with Dr. Nick. So I'm in a, a middle ground. Um, I think many on the left kind of take the Canadian and the UK as the optimum system. Mm -hmm. uh, but the reality it isn't. And this is where I agree with Rob to some extent, taking total ability to choose where you go for your medical care i disagree with that and i would actually um probably move and i, d I don't actually know what i'm speaking for rob and i am going to ask him after i've made my position what his position is but i i i think the uk and the canadian system are very unusual systems just like the american system is quite an unusual system <laughs> Where you, um, to say the least, um, and I do think a lot of libertarians and a lot of people on the libertarian right, um, they 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 live in this free market system that doesn't really exist. Um, but what you do need is strong regional um, control. I believe in moving healthcare to the state level and to the regional level and having community panels and having different systems that are suitable for that region and having a much more um, diverse um, medical system throughout the country rather than a centralised 
planned system because I, I think it does take where Rob points out, it does take away free choice and um, you get some of the worst aspects of the UK system rearing its head. I know that's long-winded, but did that, well, did that make any sense? Yeah. L let me you say know, something. Uh, I, the company yeah. that my husband worked for did not, you know, North Carolina, our insurance did not come from North Carolina. It came from Indiana because it was the cheapest that they offered. Is that not ridiculous? Yeah. So what what would you say about that, Nick? Do you think uh, I'm talking absolutely crap or what? No, um, but I, if you look at the healthcare systems around the world, one of the most successful is the Japanese. Mm. And you can go to any doctor that you want to go to, okay? And everything is covered. And they encourage you to please go. If there's anything wrong, if you have any, if you suspect anything, please go. You know, go see a dermatologist, go see a specialist, go get glasses and they actually over there they actually think that your eyes and your teeth are a part of your body so they actually uh, cover all of it okay and it's very successful and their cost uh, per capita is one of the lowest in the world because of all this uh, uh, preventative medicine and the fact that they want you to get to, to be attended to immediately so their people aren't ending up it's expensive to go to the, an emergency room our cost would go so far down if we had preventative medic medicine and preventative health care like the japanese now I, i'm not really that well versed on the the variations you know i know when i was in italy for instance uh I was over there for the Florence Biennale and a bunch of people followed us over and one of the guys fell off of a motor scooter and broke his arm. So went in, you know, and they set it, put it in a cast, did the whole thing, you know, and he had a little pouch and he pulled out a bunch of traveler's checks and it was like, um, okay, how much? And they looked like, what? Uh, no, 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 no. And as a matter of fact, right over there, you go get your pain pills and your antibiotics and, uh, if you're broke, they'll give you 50 euro. They want you to be healthy, okay? And it's it. I I, I know it works in Japan. Well, I see, where, I see where you go. I see where you go, Nick. But I think giving you 50 <laughs> euro is pushing it a bit. Um, so, they, that's what they said. I was there. So uh, exactly uh, so Rob, euros, but. so Rob, what what's your prescription to sorting out? Do, first of all, do you think there is a fundamental problem with the American healthcare system and how and if you do, um, what your what is your prescription to um, curing some of these problems? I, I don't know. I mean, the, the, the U.S. health healthcare system, I think, is hilarious because when we talk about healthcare, we say healthcare, and like we're like we're talking about the health aspect of it, and really, you know, when we talk. But healthcare really is about insurance companies. I mean, as I pointed out, my, I, I think of healthcare as an insurance company that I pay, not as the provider that, that does the doing. You know, I mean, insur insurance, if, it, if it's applied like an automobile, is something that you never want to use, right? Uh, but healthcare is something that we actively use, unlike health insurance or uh, uh, unlike uh, automobile insurance. So, you know, I, I don't know that I've got uh, a solution to healthcare, but for sure, you know, I mean, for me to have to pay nineteen thousand dollars a year for health insurance, uh, for you know, I mean, we don't have uh, any any uh, major illnesses within the family. That's just the cost of being an American now. Is nineteen grand a year, you know, j just for the purpose of being able to, if somebody gets sick or breaks their arm on a scooter, that's the cost of living in the United States. I mean, that's the free. That's that. That's being a free American. Bye, y'all. Yes, yeah. Roxanne. Thank y'all. Good going, Roxanne. Thank you. All right, thanks, you, Roxanne. Bye. Bye. Well, I'm going to continue for another Bye, 10 Roxanne. minutes, and then I'm going to call. But um, have you got um, – so you haven't got any active um, – you don't feel that – I want to investigate your position on this a little bit. So you you, you don't feel that you've got any active solu solutions – What? Because it does seem an enormous amount of money to ask you to cough up twenty thousand dollars just to get reasonable healthcare insurance. I mean, it's it's not uh, what did they call what did the president call it a Cadillac plan or whatever? I mean, it's just a uh, you know, I mean, 
for, for my company and I have I own a small business, but you know, we have uh, two plans that we can choose from typically per year, it, you know, the Kaiser Permanente style plan and then the preferred doctor plan or whatever it's called. Um, you know, and, and I guess I, I would probably imagine that I'm probably like a lot of families, you know, I mean, uh, my, my wife and I use and see healthcare differently. She, she applies it and she, since she's usually the one that's uh, applying it or using it and I'm the one that's paying for it, we're seeing things differently. I don't, and I'm not, I, I, I'm only meaning that in the way that it happens in my family. My wife is the one who generally takes care of the kids and if something, somebody's sick or needs to go to the doctor, she's the one that takes them there. She's the one that fills out all the forms and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's just, it's freaking nuts. I mean, that it's, that, that, you know, my mortgage competes, uh, you know, on the same level as what it is, what healthcare is. I mean, that's, that, that's ridiculous. Yeah. So would you, would you be, uh, are you close to any, um, not total, what would, in some courts called socialist medicine, but are you totally against any kind of regional, any kind of um, community-based um, reform of the present situation? Well, I, I like, I mean, you're, earlier you were talking about the gun clubs for, for guns, and the, the subtle difference is, is that the Second Amendment is a right. Healthcare, while it, it, while it, it's it's now claimed to be a right, I I... I uh, I don't believe that. I don't believe that that that, that I have a right or, or I have an obligation uh, to provide health care for my fellow citizens. That that's not something that I believe I was born with as an obligation. Um, so, uh, you know, while the, while the Supreme Court may now say that health care is a quote unquote right, interestingly enough, it also requires that you pay for it. Yeah, the, you know, the Supreme Court doesn't mandate that we all own a firearm. Um, but it does mandate that we buy health insurance. And that's just looks like the weirdest thing in the world. But one thing that you mentioned about the clubs is, yeah, I would definitely be in, in favor of being able to, instead of having traditional health care, be able to pay into a private plan where it, it, it's a consortium of doctors and, uh, um, and, and health care providers that, yeah, I mean, th they've got maybe a a population of surgeons and specialists and general practitioners and stuff like that. And, and I can willfully pay into it. And, you know, if, if being an adult and knowing what my expenses are, if, if I choose to say, you know what, if I've got 19 grand a year that I'm going to spend on health insurance and I probably am not going to get that. I'm probably not going to spend more than $19,000 in actual services rendered. So I'm, I'm going to choose to, to, to go to a private plan and maybe spend half the amount. Now I, I'm aware going into it that there's a risk that, you know, it might be a year where uh, it is catastrophic, but all things being being equal, I, I, I have the opportunity to, to pay into it to a system with maybe significantly so, high deductibles. You don't really, so I just want to clarify it because I've noticed in this country, and it does happen to some extent in Britain, but there, there seems to be a lot of um, propaganda and name calling in this area where I'm more interested in providing decent health care for everybody in America at a price that um, they, you don't feel you're being ripped off. And I don't really care that much how it's provided. I, I'm more interested in the end result. Um, so you, so mean, you mean you don't care how it's funded? You do care how it's provided? Yes, but I mean where it's funded, you know, um, I've, um, so you wouldn't object that these organisations that are quoting you were non-profit, that they were regionally based non-profit organisations that were quoting you? It would be cheaper if they were for-profit. Well, we disagree on that because I think I'm okay I'm with us disagreeing on it. I just, but yeah, I, I would rather work for a for. I would rather give my money to a for-profit company than a non-profit company. Yeah, but if it, if, if if the service standard was the same and the non-profit was um, quoting you cheaper, are you saying that you wouldn't go for the cheaper solution out of principle? You would go for the the more expensive policy that, you, in your eyes, was seen as as free market for profit. Yeah, the, the free market solution, it, <laughs> yeah, it, it, 
I, I think your your example is, is fictitious. The, uh -huh. non nonprofits can never compete against a for profit company because the, the, there's there's more of an there's more incentive for efficiency when there's profit involved. Oh well, that, that's where we fundamentally differ because um, I I know loads. Well, the the American insurance companies are the perfect example of where your your intellectual argument I feel totally falls down because they're the biggest wasters of resources. Well, going to right, land. and and we've got and we've got a government that props that up in, in the form of crony capitalism that's now made it mandatory and compulsory for us to have it. Uh, we don't have the option to not have it anymore. Or guess what? The usual solution, same thing as is what you guys were talking about with labor. Is oh well, let's just pay the government a fine. So 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 let's let's. I mean, you know, the, the kind of government we've got now is very is very similar to what the Catholic Church used to have. You know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, is that it's okay to sin as long as as long as everybody gets their cut. So it's the same process here in the United States. You know, it's okay to break the law and hire Mexicans legally as long as you're willing to pay a fine for it. I mean, what kind of I don't know. That just is like. Yeah, I do. I do. Makes sense um, to me. I do follow your logic there a bit, um, Rob. I, I, I just um, this is just my perspective, Rob. I, I just feel that you know I do. I'm, I'm classifying you here, and you can put me correct. I get the impression that you're um, a committed, what it's called, a committed libertarian. Um, so I do have these discussions, and some of my closest friends are libertarians. But I, I just think on the the core philosophy and your core position, belief in free enterprise as the best solution for every problem is flawed. So I, I just put my position clear to you. I, I feel the core of your philosophy is totally flawed. Um, but you you know a lot of a lot of people that have your beliefs. They honestly believe that. Am I am That's I true. putting am I putting words into your mouth, or would you classify yourself as a libertarian? Mm, I mean, I I hate taking on labels because I, yeah. I I see what it's done, particularly over the last decade, to Americans. People want the American people have taken on a sheep mentality where it, it's more important to be a label, and uh, and people don't care about their individuality anymore, uh, and and you know. It, People, like I said, want to have debates in, in herds, and nobody wants to to think for themselves or even identify as being. So, yeah, thanks. I'm going to drop out for a few minutes yeah. to get a cup of tea. Yeah. But um, Ken, um, Nick, how do you respond to that? Uh, I, with uh, just, I completely disagree. I mean, I, I, the numbers. If you look at the system, in the end result of a healthcare system is a healthy population, and we haven't got that. And the end result of what they do in Japan is a much healthier uh, population. So, what they do in Cuba, for Christ's sakes, is much healthier than us. You know, their their rates of cancer, their rates of 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 so many other, you know. Um, Heart disease is is much lower than ours because their system gives preventative care. So, I that's the you know the, the, what I'm seeing, and I, the end result is what I'm really looking at. It, it, the whole culture, and uh, if the the numbers are are correct, uh, we're spending the most, uh, the highest amount dollar amount of any of the co uh, modern countries because of this capitalist thing. I don't. So I I just disagree. I mean, I, I think you place health, uh, the quality of health based on the doctors and and I place health based on the choices that individuals make. I mean, if you could have the greatest doctor in the world, but if you're going to McDonald's every single day and eating a bunch of junk food, well, you're, I have the quality I'm a health freak. Cuba doesn't have, you know? Cuba doesn't have the, doesn't offer the, the consumer choices that the United States has. That has yep. nothing to do with it. You know, I, I doubt it has much to do with the, the quality or... Uh, or smarts of the Cuban doctors. It has more to do with the fact that it's it's cheaper in Cuba uh, and more affordable for people to to to, to eat healthy choices, uh, and it's more of an economic decision uh, than than it is the fact that uh, that it's the doctors. Yeah, I can I, you're, I agree with you. The pe the way people eat in this country is just crazy. In, in China, it was interesting how uh, they put medicine, which is 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 in the form of herbs in all their cooking all the time 
You know, it's not like something they wait till they're sick and then they take these. That all the soups and things that they have, uh, and, and they, they're they're all infused with all of these very healing and 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 health supplying herbs. And so it's um, we don't, uh, you know, and unfortunately, things like uh, McDonald's and and uh, Kentucky Fried is they're starting to pop up there. And uh, I saw, you know, one of the big things that was in China is hot dogs were really a, a new thing for the Chinese people. And they put them on a stick and they just walk around, you know, not like a corn dog or anything, just a hot dog on a stick. And they're all walking around. And I'm thinking, you poor people, you know, they're emulating the West and, you know, they're healthier. Well, when that's one of, the, one of the things I noticed in China, there's very few fat people. And there are very few skinny, sickly. They are healthier than we are and happier and more united than we are. I mean, they, you know, I went to know, dozens and dozens and dozens of factories and they weren't putting on a show for us. We'd walk in. They didn't know we were coming. And they're they're just just going for it. They're they're working hard. They're smiling, you know, and they all look healthy. They're 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 they they do uh, Tai Chi and they. You know, we we really could. Our country is not in good shape. I walk around and I get shame attacks constantly, looking at the the terrible habits that our populace indulges in as a constant. You know, so yeah, we need we need to grow up. Well, I mean, fortunately, maybe we need to grow up, but you know, maybe we just need to uh, acknowledge that we've got a free, free society, and that you know, if we're going to sit here and talk about people needing to make wise choices and stuff like that. We have to agree that, you know, if we're going to live in a free society, people also have the luxury of being able to make bad decisions. Yeah, yes, they do. You know, Unless but, it hurts somebody. Well, right. But, you know, the, the, the best way to, 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 to make people make smart decisions is, is to also make sure that, that in addition to being able to make bad decisions, they're also able to uh, enjoy the consequences of bad decisions. Well, I'm not going to argue with that because, but uh, you, you give up basically if, if government controls your life, you give up liberty for freedom. I mean, you give up security for freedom. If you want government to take care of you, you're going to have to give up some of your freedom. And that's why you have things like all the, the war on drugs. That's the government taking care of you. That's what it is. It's they think that they're doing better because they're a group of people who control the government. and think we need to keep the drugs away from folks. That's how that comes. So now they tried to outlaw sugar and cokes and stuff in New York City, and they, you know, that was overturned. But there's a balance there. It's called individual responsibility, and that's another reason why I'm a Republican because we lean towards individual responsibility. The Democrats lean towards collectivism, and that's the fundamental differences. One of the fundamental differences in the parties. Um, both in, and in the middle, both the Democrats and the Republicans, I think, are super crony, and they don't get it. The, the people in the middle, they're there for politics. They're there for something else. That's my, my opinion, my view. I think the people in the middle, for the most part, are uh, on both sides, are uh, really uninformed. You know, I keep running into this, the same thing. People that are not into politics act as if they're the bright ones. Oh, I'm not into politics because it doesn't work. It's like, well, then you're going to be ruled by lesser people. They're going to be ruled by inferior people if you're not involved. And uh, when I say that, the people in the middle, I'm talking about the elected officials in the middle. Um, those are well, the, the people, people, the people in the middle elected the them. Crony. Yeah. Yeah. No, the yeah. people. Well, yes and no. The special interest got them elected because they put out they know how I worked in campaigns. I know sort of the tricks of the trade and there's tricks out there and it's changing. You're seeing the Trump campaign really changing. You know, you guys talked earlier about Trump, Nick, a little bit. Again, I'm not a Trump supporter primarily because of his approach on killing civilians. That's not acceptable in what he says. But his campaign is very interesting to study. And um, Interesting maybe, but uh, it, there's more to my objections to him than just the fact that he wants to kill civilians. I don't like racism. I don't like xenophobia. I don't like uh, misogynist – you know, I, I, all these, these various things that he just brags about and, and – throws out there like like it's some kind of tr uh, truth a trump truth you know no, no, there's so much Jimmy, that he does making fun of cripples i mean please yeah. how, how 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 can how can and and a whole bunch 
of a big swath of America doesn't seem to mind all these things. Now, watching his campaign, if you watch his campaign, I'm looking at it from a, a technical side. By the way, we had a, a fairly high-end consultant come in and watch our show for a few minutes. Watching his campaign, because I sent him an email to come in, watching his campaign, um, you'll see he's changing. He's moderating some of his positions, and he's doing some things that I think are very smart. For example, driving this plane around and not apologizing for being who he is, I think is important. Um, Romney used to apologize for making wealth and creating capital. That was ter- as a Republican. See, Romney is one of those who want to get into the middle and become those crony capitalists. That was dumb on his part. You know, he was terrible to apologize for making wealth in America as a capitalist and running as a Republican. He was terrible. That's why he didn't get, you know, that's why McCain won because of who he was. I mean, I, I don't know why. I mean, there's more than that. I simplified it too much, but, but at least Trump is not apologizing for making his wealth. There's no yeah, reason to not- apologize in the United he's- States for becoming wealthy. Yeah, I, I, he, no need, but I do think he needs to change his uh, stance on race, on women, on disabled people. You know, he needs to change his stance on, he needs to apologize to the whole world for some of his ridiculous he moves. He doesn't apologize. He doesn't yeah, apologize. that's, that's well, you know, right. But I look at Obama and he's made tremendous mistakes in foreign policy and, and Hillary Clinton, huge foreign policy gaps. Um, with what's yep. happened in the Middle East. And I was part of it. Like I was in the country when this is happening. You know, there's there's several investigations going on right now. People aren't cognizant of both. Forced the FBI investigation, that's going to come out. And I still believe, you know, one of my forecasts is that Hillary is going to probably be slapped by that thing because there's too many people that know, like me, uh, what she did. And um, I know from just being like heavily into that. And everyone like similar, I mean, must think similar um, to see that. I don't and, think it'll happen. If, if we if we can see people as as low as as lowest learner uh, uh, walk away unscathed, well, the FBI, possibly- there's a lot of FBI agents working on this case, a lot of them, and I can't and imagine all the work under the presidency. If, yeah, there's no way well, the FBI that, does. That it's, it's, I don't think she. I, I mean, I agree with you, Bill, that what she did is egregious and wrong against the law, all that. And but I just from my my perspective is that she is like. Some of these big banks. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. We could talk. We should talk. To, too big. I want to talk about too the banking. To fail. Industry, yep. Rob, too. Uh, so we shouldn't talk. Over. Rob, I, I would like to talk about the banking industry. I've been looking closely at the banking industry. I do believe in competition. And cronyism has killed competition in banking. I mean, I used to design, build, construction. I started in the 90s. And I could not, in the early 90s, before they got into it, you could get legitimate funding from your local banks for design, build, construction. And, and when, when the big banks came in, it knocked out the smaller builders and really made it difficult, unless you're a fairly large corporation, to get the type of funding, and they sort of bought up stuff. I see the yep. banks as the biggest cronyism going right now. There's six major banks that are all bailed out by the government, too big to fail. And that was Bush. That was the cronies from Bush's group, which were I super crony. W, Bush W had, I mean, I like some of the things he did in his policies, but his crony capitalism was terrible. And I think, by the way, the first giveaway of Bush if you look what he did, I think it was the Astros, his baseball team. He basically put a bunch of investors together, bought a cheap baseball team, didn't have a crappy stadium, got put a special interest group together, got in with the city council, got them to put a special tax on the on, on the ballot for sales tax, a half cent sales tax, huge, to build a new stadium. And they funded it. Now you become rich because you get a great stadium that you've got a cheap lease on. And that's how these guys are making their money. He did that. He, in, he imposed taxes on local citizens through a sales tax for a special interest. If you look back, because I was on that level, I was at the council level. I saw people trying to do that all the time in Modesto, put a special tax on to enhance their benefit. And if you, Bush, that's a big giveaway with Bush W. That's how they think. They're cronies. And that's what's wrong with America, cronyism. I'm convinced that that's the worst thing. Bernie Sanders, I think, is an honorable guy. I don't like socialism, though, but I think he's a good guy. He's one of the better guys. Obama, great family guy, terrible in policy. I mean, his family himself. You look at his family values. I mean, taking care of his family. That's a, he's a good example there. You know, when when you guys talk about Obama and, and um, being terrible, I mean, no, I said it's a great family. I just don't but, like but, his policies. It's foreign policy. Yeah, well, no, I'm talking side. about policies, okay? Because look at where the country is right now compared to when he took over, and he and he he managed. He and his team have managed to get us to this point against a major headwind of, of Republican um, obstruction. 
Seven years, not well. I don't see any public instruction because you see, I think that's the problem. Is the leadership in this and the Congress and the House was terrible. They're the Republican. They only had, there's only six, six vetoes. There's only six vetoes from from Obama against the Congress. The Congress has done a crappy job. The Republican led Congress. They are the cronies with the Democrats with with Obama. <laughs> and I told you about some of this corporation, Nick. That I was I cool. give you specific Sorry, names Bill. of corporations, and you've looked them up. The ones that I worked with. Uh huh. Big time cronies. Obama yep. is as crony as any president we've ever had. Oh, I he's yeah, and he's doing exactly. But uh, and Bush was too. What, Look what Bush did with the and the banking regulation was all the Democrats were running the banking organizations. Uh, what was that guy who retired? I'm trying to think of his name. He came out. I'm trying to think of his name. He was the head of the banking. We should have let um, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac fail. They should have let been. some of the big banks fail, and they should have reestablish the small competitive banks. I agree. So anyway, that was Bush doing that. And I mean, they're all the same. I, mean, I, th I see Hillary Clinton as just right in there between Bush and, and Obama. The same thing. Yep. Yep. So anyway, I, it's going to be tough. This next election cycle. I, I hate to see who's going to be the candidates. One thing I love forecast. I forecast that it uh, would not be a Bush and um, a Bush and Clinton thing. Though, by the way, if you look at it, at least the Republicans, you know, you, you guys are bitching about the Republican. I, I mean, the, the left was bitching about the Republican candidates. At least we're not run by the crony party itself. The Democrats are being run by a crony party right now with Hillary. You know, at least the Republicans have this like open party thing and they're having competitive discussion and dialogue. Oh, I disagree with you completely. You don't think so? No. The, the, you no, know, they're the, just as bad. Party itself I think they're is just not a supporter. Bad. Party itself is a supporter of Bush. And then you see Bush, what's happening to Bush. Bush was the insider, the Carl Rowe and all those folks. Yeah, Cheney. Yeah, it's interesting. You know what? Uh, at least we now have competition. The, the Democrats don't. Democrats are taking Bernie and saying, go away, Bernie. Uh, that's not true. That's not true. Watch what happens in the primaries. Where, where That's where the, the truth is finally going to come out. It's only a few of the Democrats, the, the blue dog Democrats, the middle Democrats yeah, that are saying, go away, Bernie. But the rest of the country. And did you did you hear earlier, Bill, when we were talking about um, the numbers, how and, and how, you know, they they. They poll and they say how favorable, you know, very favorable a little yeah, bit, yeah. you know, and, and that it, that Hillary's numbers are very favorable. Those are the people that are going to vote is at 39 percent. And which means that probably that will translate into 40 or maybe 42 percent of the people that say that they're behind Hillary are going to vote. And Bernie, his number of very uh, favorable is 78 percent, which is going to translate into to more like 80 percent of the people that say they're for Bernie are going to show up at the polls. And then there's the millennials, which you don't see on mainstream TV. But I was at an event last night, a, 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 a millennial event to do the debate watch. And it was um, there's a fervor that I've never seen. It, it, Obama kind of had that, too. And if you looked at the numbers when Obama in the first election, uh, Hillary at this juncture was um, is not as far ahead of Bernie as as she was ahead of Barack Obama at at the early. You know, she had like yeah, a twenty nine point lead. Yeah. yeah. And and then and then Barack won. So when you see and, and I think one of the another factor that I think is really important is that the, the past presidents of the Republican Party. Bush, for instance, Bush w. Cheney, mm -hmm. they're not going to come out. President. Cheney's not the president. <laughs> I know, the, but the, that crew, they're not going to come out and and um, you know stump for Trump or in, or whoever happens. No, to they're not. Him. They're not going to come out. They're not going to come out. They're they're, they're they, they all the good old boy network is not going to support Trump. They'll they'll do it begrudgingly if they do because Trump will they, tear but, them up. Trump. One thing about Trump is he doesn't have to be a crony. Now, I, again, I do not like what he said about, you know, killing civilians one iota, but he doesn't, he's not a crony. Trump is not a crony right oh, now. Disagree. Right now, he's not a crony. He can't say he's a crony because the cronies hate him. Well, the cronies hate him. Cronies are scared to death of him. Okay, but here's here's what's going to happen in the election is that Obama and uh, Bill Clinton and uh, all of that crew are going to come out and campaign for the de whichever Democrat does get elected, and yeah. there's a lot of talent there that's going to be campaigning. So I'm not I'm not sure I'm not sure about that. If Rubio shows up or somebody like that or some centrist oligarchy, they may quietly not campaign. Now Hillary, they call it the Hillary, uh, they call it the Clinton Democrat wing. 
of the Democrat mm -hmm. Party. There's powers within the party. And they said there's the Clinton power and the Obama power and that Clinton has more power than Obama within the party itself. You've, you've had to watch that, that Obama, yeah. the, the, the party hasn't taken him overly serious. They take the, oh, the Clintons have held their strength within the party. They've worked on that in the, in the last eight years. Well, years. like Bernie said, it's about a political revolution. And I believe that that's what mm -hmm. I'm seeing right now. It's a complete political revolution, a complete. I mean, everybody who is satisfied, is anybody satisfied with what we've got? I mean, about I'm 25 of the American public, I think, is satisfied if I some of the polling I've seen. Well, I'd like to see that because I, I haven't seen it. Everybody I know is upset. Everybody. We've well, I mean, never just, been just more polarized. At, just bring the polling up and look at it's like satisfaction and stuff. Yeah, I'd, li I'd like, like to. Check the polling data. Yeah. It's not 100%. It's like 20. It's still low. 25, 30%. It's very low. The president's approval rating that's is very low right now, too. Oh, yeah. God, it's like 22% or something. The last yeah. yesterday I saw, you know, if you can believe the polls. You it's know, the real polling, low. you got to look at the scientific part of the polls. I do believe some of the polling, if you dig into them and understand how they're done and then look at, but what you said too, there's a lot of wild cards and things change. The, um, the millennium's coming out in force this cycle. I think you see a lot of millennium voting uh, this time in presidential elections. Yeah, um, you, I think, you bet. I think Republicans, yeah. You bet. It's the Republicans, be... I think, are going to have problems too across the country uh, in the in the Senate and the Senate because I know a lot of Republicans that don't, don't even want to come out and vote for their own Republicans because of what they've done in, in the center, the center Republicans, you know, leadership in this, the Senate and Congress. So yeah, and I think that Trump is driving a lot of uh, Republicans away. Uh, you I know? think he's pulling some Dems over though too. You don't see him. I, I bet there's a group of Democrats who. Uh, like to see what he's doing, especially That's a labor. A, I, have, labor, I labor. have not run into one. How about you labor? Know, and I go to a lot of rallies. I go to, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, on the board of directors of the democratic club in Laguna. Well, I'm in Laguna Beach. That's like quiche eaters. Animal. The what? That's like quiche people. Laguna Beach is quiche. They sit around and eat quiche all day. <laughs> I know. I, I I'm don't. not being, I'm trying to be funny. I'm not trying to be uh, mean spirit. <laughs> but Laguna is a, a different part of the world. I mean, Beverly Hills, Laguna, Newport Beach. Yeah, we're, we're in Orange County, which is, you know, famously uh, Republican, famously a red county. Right. But yeah. Laguna Beach is 53% uh, um, blue. So we're, you know, we have the majority there. But we're a different town. You know, we are much more liberal than the rest of the surrounding areas. You know, that's for sure. So which town down there? In Orange County, you got Huntington Beach, Laguna, Newport Beach, Santa, Santa Ana. Ana. Santa Ana is definitely dim. Laguna is definitely dim. How about Newport and uh, Huntington Beach in those places? Surf City. Uh, Huntington Beach is on on the border. It's pretty close, even there. But Newport, Corona del Mar, Yorba Linda, Orange. Oh yeah, all Nixon those land. are all yeah. They're all conservatives. Absolutely, you know. But we're getting a lot closer for the county because I do work with the Central Committee, the OC Democrats, and uh, I'm, I'm lucky. They, great. they just commissioned California. me to do a bust of tr a Truman. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to talk. California is a very Democrat state. It's one of the, the I mean, that New York are one of the top Democrat states, I think. Absolutely. The overall, the popular. And the whole, they talk about cronies. Go up to Sacramento. They're known for cronyism. They, they decide who's going to be their assembly and Senate between them before they even vote in the primaries, you know, between Republican and Democrat a lot. And they gerrymander like maniacs there in California. We could talk about that too. California is a very controlled state by government. Thank you, Rob. But, you know, there's a lot of wealth there. That said, there's a ton of wealth in California. I mean, they're the seventh largest economy. Can't quite figure it out. Though I do know that we just landed, um, we landed Tesla here in Nevada, just across the state. And we just landed a huge new car company down in Las Vegas that decided to come here in, in Nevada. We're getting a lot of California big industry coming into Nevada, which is interesting. Oh, absolutely. You got a Tesla, big Google yeah. factory, didn't you? Big Google. I've got Google, Google? Tesla. Yeah, uh, we got Microsoft here in Reno, but we have the world's largest uh, industrial park um, uh, to just to the um, east of Reno proper, and it's the world's largest. And what they've done is they put in all the roads to infrastructure, all privately, uh, done through the county with the county and the and the private investors, and they've got everything in place so businesses can move and, and grade very fast. So that's kind of interesting to see what's happening. But no, California is a unique study itself. That's why I think people, it's good to talk about California a little bit. And, but in, in Orange County too, I guess Orange County, still, I assume, how's San Diego doing towards parties? I haven't paid attention down there. San Diego is very progressive. And, uh, you know, they just opened up the state's first desalinization plant. Mm -hmm. 
I saw and, that. Yeah, it, it's uh, right now it, the, the capacity is about 3% of their water needs, but it should grow uh, quite a bit up to uh, between 10 and 20. And of course, they're talking about doing one in um, Huntington Beach. And of course, what you know what the reason they want to do it in Huntington Beach is because right there is our uh, sewage exactly. treatment plant. Mm -hmm. And the sewage treatment plant produces methane. And so what they'll do is they'll use, they'll trade, um, they'll give methane. Uh, water. Yeah, they'll for then trade for the methane. So that it'll help, you know, with a, uh, because it takes a, a ton of power to desalinate. Yeah. And I'm, I'm one of the things uh, I've been involved in, in getting San Onofre shut down. Which it is. If, if there was a reason to keep a, a nuclear power plant going, it would be for desalinization, not for power. I mean, if, if they could, you know, really get it safer because of the, the tremendous draw that it takes to do the desalinization. And if we can do it without a carbon footprint, that would be great. You know, water is going to be a real, real crisis for the whole world here soon. They, soon it's coming roaring at us. California um, in the 60s, thank goodness in the 60s, they invested and spent money on their water systems and build the Great Delta Project, things like that. If they didn't, they'd be out of luck. They haven't built anything in the last 40 years, California, for water conservation or systems and processes. And no dams. The, uh, the Auburn Dam was a big issue. I'm, folks, I'm, I'm from Design, Build, Construction, and I worked in the 90s in California. So got a little background, and I still license a <coughs> commercial real estate broker in the state and have a couple of small <laughs> contracts I watch. You know the buildings, Nick. Oh, yeah. Jeez. So that's my background <laughs> in California. And plus, I was raised there when I was young. But yeah. uh, I escaped to Nevada. But it's you know it's tough here. I mean, I have all my friends. I mean, still a lot. There's still you can make a lot of money in California. It's still a great place to run a business, and they do some things right too. Um, they have an income tax, but they don't. When you start a business, they don't hit you too hard when you start the business, and and a lot of places don't have. Um, they have a state tax, but they don't have uh, other taxes on your on your local business. It's hard to explain, but they've, they've got some good things there. Um, I like their approach on a lot of licensing. Uh, they're less crony than Nevada for licensing. Nevada is very crony in licensing. Me that isolates people and keeps people out. It's a lot tougher to get your licenses here in Nevada. They're now, restricted. Out of curiosity, Bill, what is the uh, the demographic of the the political demographics there um, in Nevada? Reno is a Republican um, city, it was, ironically, with mostly Democrats on city council because the Republicans here don't know how to campaign, get people elected. <laughs> and what happens is the Republicans are pretty old here. They retire here because there's no income tax. And we get a lot of folks here who just retire and don't run businesses. And so they're all, all their, their biggest concern is, you know, their happy years in retirement. And then they're, they're very uh, stubborn in their ways and it just interesting. So we still have a lot of young people who probably lean to the left who come out and vote. Um, I just, my great Mac computer here just went off. That's a good question there. Uh, Las Vegas is definitely turning more Democrat. Northern Nevada is Republican. You get out, but you get out in the rural, rural counties and it's all Republican. You get out I'm curious because we're rural counties, all Republican. We're going to do phone banking. Um, and the, the Bernie campaign has yeah. asked us to, uh, California to concentrate on Nevada and phone banking is one of my least favorite things to do oh, yeah, politically, but it's one of the it. most effective. And so, um, you know, the numbers just don't lie. The more calls, the more people you have uh, making phone calls, the, the, the higher your numbers are going to be. And that's the, an absolute fact on both sides for, you know, Democrats and Republicans. And, you know, it, it's interesting when I was doing it for Obama, uh, you know, I, I was never, I don't remember once getting cussed out or, you know, a lot of people were very nice that I completely disagree with you. I'm going to vote for whoever else, you know, but I want to make a follow up call. People, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, to check, check in on those people. Yeah, I, I, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm real curious what the response is going to be now. So we, we will see, we will see, we're going to be doing it next week. That's interesting. You have to tell us how, how it went and who you called and you're trying to get the votes for Bernie, I take it. Well, yeah. Well, that, absolutely. Uh, which is why that data, data see, got those this is where the data base being blocked because that's where the numbers come from, yeah. the DNC. And if, you know, if that data is not there, then there's nobody to call. And, uh, you know, I can't think of the name. It's called vote, 
voter ball used to be called for the Republicans, and I can't think what the Democrats use. It's called voter ball. And that's the, the parties do this, and they let the voter registration, all the information. It really saves the candidates a lot of money. You get an account to get in those. You used to have to go to the county recorders and grab all this information, but the parties got smart and contracted it out. I can't think of what the Democrats use. Vo- voter vault is what the Republicans use. Yeah, it's the same thing. It's, it's you know, similar but different. There's different organizations that run them. Let me see. Um, yeah, they pay six hundred thousand dollars a year to access that data. The Bernie right, campaign. Right, right. I know it's good. I've seen it. It's a good system they use. So voter vault GOP is voter vault for sure. For sure. Let me see what the Democrats use. I, I I know the name. I just can't think of it. That's really interesting design and it's so important on GOTV. Get out the vote. GOTV stands for get out the vote. GOTV is where you go door to door. But I know I think some of that is actually you don't have to do that, especially in some races now. You there's other ways to make contact with people. Well, from the numbers I've seen, and it's been pretty consistent that that is the most, it's better th- than even walking the precincts, than, you know, going door to door. It's more effective. Um, people do occasionally run into problems, but I mean, it, walking precincts is, is, is critical. It's really important, but um, the phone calls are, they, they end up getting the most votes. So getting out people out to vote and then you got absentee in California has a lot of absentee voting too, absentee ballots. They have whole prank things that are absentee now. Yeah. They went to early absentee, which it, what do you guys think about what like Australia has done um, making it um, mandatory to vote and it's working out really well. They don't have a constitution. Like, we don't force people to do things in the United States. We're a free country. Except healthcare. It's good. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Or getting a license, or that's paying not, taxes. That's not, that's not All these things are forced. That's not compulsory as part of as part of living. Healthcare is compulsory as part no, of no, being they, an American. Nick, on, on the license, on the licensing, one of the theories too is you can go to different states, and different states have different rules. Idaho has like two licenses in the construction trade. You used to, you used to have, uh, I think it was plumbing and electric. You didn't even need it for general. You didn't even need a license. So it varies from that's state scary. to state. <laughs> that's true. scary that was i remember when i was up there i was doing something up there i forgot um but that's the states have the rules but the more the more controls you put on the less freedoms and liberties you have you give up again you give up freedom for security that's the whole balance there so how much government do you want the more government you have you're inherently going to have less money and less freedom the other thing too is you know when we talk about the rich getting the money um what the, the concern is is the either the government has the money or the rich has the money so is, are the are, are the rich going to create more jobs with that money, or is government going to create more jobs? Well, look what's happened. They don't. Is it the is it government stash not- it away overseas? Don't pay taxes on it. I mean, I can't. <sighs> yeah, Apple. But, we know Apple has a lot of money over in Ireland because of the the tax laws here. In fact, that's why Apple has their accounting here in Reno because they want to keep as much money out of California as possible. You bet. Because of uh, they, California, someplace has a mill tax on the high end, it means they charge per thousand uh, money off the top. So if you get a ton of money flowing into like a accounting area, and it's a California corporation, you might get you know taxed high. That's at the high end, but they like, still you yeah, got you still have Apple still has a, a big plant where they do all the design work with eleven thousand people. Hey, we seem to have some interesting visitors. Uh, step on up, call in. Yeah, um, I'm looking at, I'm trying to find what their equivalent is, Voter Vault, uh, GOTV. Like, oh, shoot, I cannot, it's really driving me nuts. I know it, too. I'll think about it. Um, the, the, Voter data, the data for the, the DNC? The, the DNC company. data, yeah. I'm trying like to think RTN or something like that. Um, uh, yeah, and, and, and you do know that uh, Debbie Schultz-Wasserman, who's the chairman of the DMC, uh, made the decision to cut off Bernie's data and the, the the CEO of the data company was oh. on Hillary's staff, and uh, the vice president is a Wasserman, um, Debbie's nephew. Man, talk about crony, crony operation. You know, there it is. And the DNC has had their finger heavily on the scale for Hillary, and, and it, which is the reason that they've scheduled these debates on the worst possible time, Saturday night on a no, holiday. That's the, Demi- that's the Democrats. Want- what about the worst possible times are the best possible times for them. But if, for, the, for Hillary, for Hillary, it's the best. Right. For Hillary, for, it's the best. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, but that's why I'm Bernie saying the Democrats the- got the crony. They're the control. By the way, it's I, I got it. There's the, the web page. There's the link to uh, 
it's ng van it used to be it's called NG van, van right they use right. van uh -huh. and it's fun because when people come by and knock here reno has very small assembly districts and and i'll tell you what the democrats do a pretty darn good job here but when they knock i always like, can i look at your list you know and they knock on the door and i'm looking at the van list and you can tell right away if they're democrat republican in the nonpartisan races see here, here locally, you have a lot. The nonpartisan races are like city council, but supervisors are partisan. And the Democrats, what they do is they'll help the local nonpartisans get elected at council, and the, and the Republicans don't do that. They don't identify who the Republicans are to the Republican voters. So you can target in just a Republican household, like who's running for local office, and the Republicans don't do that. The Democrats do do that. In fact, they did something I thought was amazing. They had a flyer from every one of the candidates running from all the way up to the highest level governor and packaged together and with a rubber band dropped off on each house. I thought that was really, every Democrat house, that is. I thought that mm -hmm. was really good. So, well, anyway, um, we'll probably stay on for another like 30 minutes. Uh, it's getting late. I have to edit the show. It takes me about an hour to edit the iTunes. Um, some things we did today are kind of neat. We've got um, iframes going. If you go to republicanmensclub.org on their front page, they have a live place to watch it, and some people are watching it. When people watch it there, you don't show up up above. Um, New Media Gold has a live link now where you can watch it. New Media Gold, and I put those links in. Um, Meetthevoter.com, of course, you got to scroll down through it. Now, the reason why you have to scroll and meet the voter, I don't want any of us accidentally coming up on Meet the Voter. When we're on, we should only really have, you got to really watch that you don't go to another blab site because you're going to get an echo. So that's some of the things. Well, what do you think is going to, you know, and, and finishing up today, what do you think is going to happen uh, this week? What do you think is going to happen in, the, in like the Bernie Sanders election? Oh, are you? You're, What's Bernie uh, doing this week? Yeah. Well, Bernie's doing great. What's Bernie's, he going to do this week? You think? Uh, he's going to keep. He's going to stay the course. Do exactly what he's been doing. He hasn't changed anything he said or anything he's been after in forty years. Hasn't changed a thing. And I thought it was really great. The, uh, how about that? Trump and Bernie agreeing on something and that was how to approach ISIS and forget about Assad for now. Right. I think that's actually and, good. Yeah. I think it, that we need to, you know, because if we get, get rid, rid of, of ISIS, you know, it will turn, it'll be another Libya, another Iraq, you know, we got rid of them and uh, look what happened complete, you know, now we've got ISIS. So we uh, getting rid of these bad guys maybe wasn't the best. Well, obviously not the yeah. best idea. Um, so who knows what, I, I just let Assad, I mean, he's a butcher, you know, it's horrible, but, yeah, uh, but right as now, we, we look the back, biggest problem it would have been better to leave some of these dictators in place as we look back. Yep. I can't imagine being any worse than what happened. The devil you know. Much, the, the gazillion dollars we spent in those wars. Um, yeah. Cheney made out pretty good. Halliburton, those guys, they're, 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 they're sitting fat. Oh, and so did uh, caring. Nick. I can I can lay, label some other companies too. So, oh, <laughs> absolutely. That side. Yeah, they're yeah. careful not do it though. Um, <laughs> it's a it's a war machine. Yeah, but you know, I, and I do agree with the concept of using special operations forces and uh, some and, and fit for an internal defense when you help build the other armies and people. But you got to be careful of that. It's a two-edged sword. Um, we built up the Taliban to fight uh, you know the Russians, and look what it got us. Well, you know, and uh, again, because we didn't finish the job, you know, yeah. So what do you mean by finish the job? Well, what's we should have uh, helped them with more infrastructure uh, than than what, you know, and stayed the course. And it, it, we just left after after we, we, you know, gave them missiles and all that stuff. Then we just took off. We should have helped more with infrastructure because the, the people. Uh, we're upset and it gave it a perfect opportunity for Al Qaeda to form and, and the Taliban to, you know, do what they're doing with their, their religious stuff. Well, what, what happened is uh, the Muj, Mujahideen and the warlords, there's 12 warlords came into Afghanistan. We're in Afghanistan already. They were actually fighting the Northern Alliance. We're actually fighting the Russians. So all mm -hmm. of the warlords who are fighting the uh, Russians basically broke up the country and tried to unify them under one government, but the warlords would fight among themselves. And then in, um, what was it? What year was it? 2008. I'm trying to think. But anyway, I was in Jalalabad where uh, 2000, uh, 2000, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think, 2000 uh, uh, Toyota trucks came over with nothing but Taliban from the uh, Pakistan and just overthrew the warlords in a very short period of time. So most of the warlords um, either converted over to the Taliban's way of thinking and they had a, a 
just a, a tyrannical, tyrannical government that they had to live under, under the Taliban. Yeah. And that's, they took over. And then what happened is um, Om, uh, one eye Omar, uh, I forgot his name, the president of the running or the mullah of basically Afghanistan wouldn't turn over a, a bin Laden who was being protected in Jalalabad in, in the Tora Bora area. And um, that's how we got involved because if he would have turned him over, we would have never gone into Afghanistan and we just left the, uh, the Taliban in power. So that's the whole story of that. That's, that's, that's the story of what happened. Now that said, if we would have gone in there with the warlords, it would have been very difficult to sort those out and actually do any infrastructure, any work because they fought among themselves so much and they would steal from each other. So it's really hard when they, when you have an unstable government or area, it's hard to give them aid because then it's all corruption. That's my business. You know, that was my business in civil military operations. So yep. that that's the problem afterward. It's very difficult. And we have USAID does a lot of that too. Aid is supposed to do that from the state department. So that's, um, that's kind of crazy. That was a crazy time. But that said, I think we shouldn't have really tried to destroy the Russians by empowering and paying for all the, all the Taliban and the Mujahideen and all the war, warlords. Yeah, I, I have a, a question for Rob, and it's the question that Jonathan just uh, tweeted. And uh, that is, what do you think about the uh, Trump campaign? I didn't see his tweet. Yeah, I got it here, but he said, he just asked, you know, what do you think of um, the Trump? He wanted your opinion, and I, I'm interested too. I mean, I didn't see the tweet. It was, it, the tweet was just, what do I think about Trump's campaign? The Trump campaign. Uh-huh. Uh, I don't have much of an opinion on it. I mean, you know, I, I think Trump's do doing a fantastic job publishing and publicizing Trump. Um, but I think, I mean, I don't think he'll... Uh, um, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, he, for sure, for sure, he, he you know he's certainly making the news and make, making a big name of himself in terms of branding. But I, I don't think that, uh, that that he'll ever be president. Uh, I don't think he'll make the Republican Party. I mean, I think you know that's it, to me. To me, it's more believable that that he would that the long game for him from a business perspective would be to not win and then have and then run business under a Clinton campaign. I mean, that there's more in it for me personally. <laughs> yeah, there's still some people that have the idea that it's a shadow campaign, that he's really a Democrat. But, you know, who knows? I don't know. Uh, let's talk about that for a second. Uh, first of all, if Trump isn't there, who do you think is going to take his place? You're asking me? I think Rubio. I don't think Bush can come back from being so de decimated mm -hmm. right now. I don't, none of the Trump supporters are going to support Bush right now. Yeah. It's no, like I 40%. Think probably Rubio. That's and I've been saying that all along that I think that, you know, he is I, I, he scares me, but he's not the, a raging maniac. You know, he doesn't say these uh, outrageous things. And what scares you about him? Uh, his. Uh, well, first of all, I don't like religion. Uh, and that we he is, you know, brings up the religious aspect of himself and his beliefs constantly and i think there's no place in politics for religion who are you talking Our about constitution uh marco rubio so you know that's that's a part and and i think he a lot of his what scares me is is how attractive he is to the public i would be more afraid of him than trump because he makes himself attractive he makes himself and that's my biggest worry is that he he could win that way, because you know th this this election, and I'm sure we all have the same feelings with our side. You know, this next president is probably going to elect four uh, Supreme Court judges. That is going to change the history of our country, right there. So that's where all of the Democrats that I know that are really looking at at some of the issues. That's one of the big ones, and it doesn't get talked about that much. You know, in, in neither debate did they mention that. And I thought that they really should have. You know, this is going to be a big deal for the history and the future of our nation is the what, you know, are we going to have goofballs or are we going to have uh, reasonable people? I mean, if we get a bunch of right wing uh, Christians, then uh, you can the First Amendment, you know, well, it, they're going to they're saying that we're a country uh, under God, that we're a country, um, you know, that that Jesus 
is going to rule. I uh, really worry about that um, because Under there's God, too much you, different things. Under God is acceptable. That, that, that's a whether you're, whether you're Jew or whatever it might be, unless you're an atheist, that we're a country under God. That's in our. That's been there for since the 50s. Since the 50s, which I disagreed with then and completely disagree with now. I mean, because uh, who who knows God? I mean, really, it's no, all I mean, conjecture. We respect, we, we respect the Creator, like Ben Franklin, um, the Deist. They respect the Creator. There is a Creator. There is a power larger than what we are as individuals. That that's well, what it of means. Course, to me. Every Adam, God is, doesn't mean that he's entering day to day that we have a respect for a power bigger than ourselves. Humble, humbling. Hey, one atom, if you released the energy in one atom, it's like a quarter stick of dynamite. So obviously there's powers that are, are huge all around yeah, us. That's, that's there's right. no respect. denying that. But uh, I think religion needs to be out of politics. Well, you know, it's a free country. And if I if someone wants to say that they're this religion or that, they should have every right to run for president well, they, and say that. That said, though, they should make decisions based on that's what, what I'm, that's what I mean. They are who they if are. Anybody but, you know, can do Christians have a right. You want. I practice yeah. Buddhism, but not as a religion, as just a lifestyle. I meditate and, you know, try and live with compassion and um you know, basically that's it. You know, my religion is friendliness. That's what the Dalai Lama says. And then, you know, right. he also says if uh, science proves uh, something wrong with Buddhism, then Buddhism needs to change. You, you know, know, ironically, a Buddhist, um, and at least where I was in Afghanistan, more Buddhists have been slaughtered over the ages than Christians by the Islam. Possibly. I don't know that yeah, those yeah, numbers. It was all like they destroyed the religion in northern northern part of Asia. Well, in China, yeah, they've really. Oh no, they, in in uh, Afghanistan, man, that used to be a, there used to be Buddhists in Afghanistan prior to mm -hmm. six hundred. It's mostly Buddhists uh, in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Prior to six hundred, there's beautiful. Um, we dug up some mm -hmm. of them, but the Taliban blew up two of the giant Buddhas. I've been to the site when they blew it up. Yeah, that but nuts? that was it, they. They used to go up because um, I know the history in there. Uh, Bamian, Bamian's where the giant Buddhas are. They would actually, Bamian held out for a while, but they would go up and just slaughter the, uh, the, the Buddhists early on in the religions. And in, yeah, in China Bamian. did the same yeah. thing. Um, that's China. That's now, that's no more modern history, isn't it? With China. Yeah. This is back in, you know, six, seven hundreds when the, they're converting people. The last people to convert to, to being Muslims in Afghanistan were the, uh, place called in 1901, Nuristani, uh, which is high in the uh, in in the extension of the um, called the Hindu Kush at 14,000 14, to eight thousand, Nuristani converted to uh, Muslims because they would go up and actually hunt Nuristans. Nuristanis, Nuristanis go back to an ancient Indian type tribal religion. There's one group equivalent to Nuristani on the other side in Pakistan, which are not Muslims in that region. So. Really interesting history. Really interesting stuff. How tribes and people can act over a period of years. So, just just a thought to think about. It's a weird place. You know, we didn't talk much about talk about religion. That's what's going on with the Muslims right now. We've got this extremist. You know, I saw something. It's not the friendly. I mean, eighty five percent of Muslims are worldwide are very peaceful people, and they live within their religion. It's a new. It's evolved. But the extremists adopt a a. I forgot. It's going back to the original writings or something, but it's um, Sharia. And that's, but it's a, well, it's no, Sharia a, it's law. A, no, no, Sharia law a, is a lot of countries have Sharia law, but it's not crazy Sharia law. Yeah, it's a, it's a crazy interpretation of uh, yeah, Sharia law. Yeah. A really yeah, violent, back. crazy interpretation, and uh, like all religions, most religions have uh, evolved. But the uh, yeah. which is why I don't like to say and don't like to hear the word Islamist. Uh, extremists you know because that's well, like jihadist is one of the words that's being used and i think jihadist that's a is great it, that's an you know, appropriate word a jihadist someone's, i forgot which one one of the candidates said um all muslims are not jihadists but all jihadists call themselves muslims yeah but uh and did, did you see what I, I put uh, that in call Bihawk, did you see what bihawk just uh tweeted about china uh, it's a multi-religious yeah, yeah, yeah. Taoism, multi Buddhism, yeah. Islamism, Protestant, yep. Catholic. And when I was in China, that both times I saw churches and synagogues and temples everywhere. Mm -hmm. Even though our media says, you know, that it, it, they're oppressed and this yeah, kind of thing. I, well, I've had, I've had, they're not. I've had 
I've had one niece over there who is a, uh, a, a, a pair, a, a niece who is a, oh, I can't think of what, which church it was, but she was over there as a, uh, over there working care. with her church. No, 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 not that not, niece. That's not Most Juliana. Two, oh, no, I had two nieces. They, she didn't go with religion. My niece from my oh. wife's side okay. was over there as a missionary and, and uh-huh. highly restrictive what they had to go through. They couldn't talk. They'd be monitored. They were, they were controlled to the nth degree by the government. Where? Um, I can find out exactly the city. Uh, yeah. yeah. Really when, how long ago years. was that? Um, she came back last year. Because uh, I was. I'll, I'll have to introduce her to her. Talk to her. She's the first. I was shooting person. my mouth off everywhere, telling him things that were supposedly, you know, yeah. verboten. I was promoting meditation. I, I, yeah. This and, is just. Uh, yeah. yeah. So Rob just. Rob, I'm going to hop over to. Uh, Okay. Comments. Oh, he's over the comment section. So we'll, Nick, I think we'll probably finish it up. It's been a good, good discussion today. Hey folks, I have a um, iTunes. It's going to be up meet the voter. We're just testing it out right now. I'd love to see you come over to uh, timelines of success.com this afternoon or tonight and listen or listen on your iPhone with the uh, sort of get the numbers up, maybe rate a little bit. If we get the numbers up high enough, we'll put that 30 minute iTunes uh, portion up on its own channel. Um, Nick, your color looks great. By the way, Nick is using a Chromebook. Congratulations. We got Chrome working like a maniac. Oh my God. This is the best computer I've ever used ever. It's so quick. It, it's unbelievable. Uh, it's got a 15.6 inch uh, monitor and um, the, the graphics are HD, just impeccable. And it out the door, it was $272. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I can't believe it. It does everything. And there's over a thousand apps google apps mm-hmm. so you can do anything with this computer i mean anything i'm just amazed hey and for my this. commercial I'm, I'm developing netcasting 101 and i started out <laughs> before we had blab writing this and creating Thanks, it. <laughs> saw Susie. Susie was in and out she's gone now yeah she came up and left hmm. she must be playing with the system trying to learn it hey but uh I, I, <laughs> things changed but before you go into itunes jumping from uh, jumping from uh, Blab to YouTube is really easy. And then the web page is the next thing. But jumping to iTunes is huge. It's tough. Hey, Johnson's back. You can, hey, buddy. He, he's down in his, cl- he's down in his uh, Man cave. collective work area. Are you, what's the name of the place? Starbucks. Oh, no, no. That's Starbucks? Yeah, it's his second home. God, I forgot the place down in Carson City. Well, it was a great show, wasn't it, Bill? I think we covered... Very a good lot show. Of good content, and I think um, Nick. Excellent show. Nick, you did an excellent job. Your your video quality and yeah, sound really quality good. is spot on, and I love the green headphones. <laughs> There's hope. <laughs> There's hope. Yeah, there is. Uh, you know, apologize for the previous glitches, but um, and then today at the very beginning when I first came on, uh, I had come on earlier. You know, before the show. Mm-hmm. before me the press and everything worked just great and then i came on and there was no sound and it took me a minute so i had to refresh and i think there's a little bit of a problem with uh the he- the plug on the headphones because i had to wiggle it around and then suddenly it came on oh, on, the, on this yeah it, it was not the, not the computer no no no, no oh and no, the it headphones was, itself yeah yeah, headphones. yeah. The headphones. those don't look like super expensive headphones yeah they're they're great they sound yeah everything is everything's working because last night I went to a blab and several people came on. That was interesting on the test. Keep on blabbing. Keep on blabbing. Go and join other people's blab and practice. Yep. We'll get yeah, you up on Twitter. Um, I hope um, people. Um, I hope people appreciated what we've discussed. You know, um, I love getting um, people with different opinions on, and um, I try and treat them with respect, even if um, I don't really agree with everything they say. Um, but I think we've had some interesting um, points of view, Nick, haven't we? Yes, I thought, and uh, this was the best program yet, uh, other, you know, than the, the the one we had after Paris. But I think, you know, I'm still thinking that our real launch will be after the first, and I yeah. can hardly wait when we really we're, we're getting more and more together. Um, more, I think everything is improving a, a great deal. So. We I'll, I'll get better. I'll, I'll get oh, better at this. Really huge jump this week. Buying the Chromebook. And in one week, you figure, we figured it out. We're still learning about Chrome. Yeah, yeah, which I would really recommend. No, the Chromebook. Yeah. 
You wouldn't yeah. recommend. Oh no, I would. Oh, would, would, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, are you kidding me? This is the best bargain I, I've you know run across. Two seventy two, Jonathan. Two hundred seventy two dollars out the door. Well, folks, you gotta realize too. You're using a um, you're using a um, a uh, Logitech cam. I think a nine twenty and a little stand, which is good. And you're using a mic, so you've had a couple of things to it to make that good. You your picture today is phenomenal. Well, I'm not using the camera. This is this is the this is the camera on the computer, Bill. Oh wow! Wow, wow. it's amazing. Yeah, this this thing is amazing. The sound we tested it last night with wow. Jonathan. And the sound isn't as high quality as the camera, <laughs> but when I put the camera on. It's no better than this, so I didn't hook it up. Yeah, and we raise it up. You look good. Well, anyway, congratulations, Nikki. Come on. Now we got to get your social media and everything tied in just right, which we'll work on. <laughs> yep. And Jonathan sent me some stuff, too, to work on last night. I was working. I, I caught about 25% of water cooler on the uh, Twitter. Twitter is something we really have to ex twit, expand yeah. in more. Yep. Especially, especially Bill, if you're... Um, as I pointed in my email, a lot of millenniums and, and Generation X, because of their industrial expansion in Reno, they yeah. will be looking to move to the Reno area. And um, those two groups, they use Twitter a lot, Bill. Yep. Hey, by the way, I want to say Marty Mc, Marty McPad, Pat, I'm sorry, Marty McPad, is I say that right? I recognized him because he worked for ESPN for 19 years and he's on right now. No, all right. Hey, thanks, Marty. Um, come up sometime. I know you do uh, sports, and you've got your own uh, uh, podcasting uh, branch. And I have podcasters home, but I think this whole world is changing. I'll probably go to the national. I'll probably go to National Broadcasters Association. I got a VIP last year to it, which was really nice. I'll probably pay this year to go to it, and um, I'll be at the National Broadcasters Association meeting in April in Las Vegas. I just want to ask Nick as a, a as a finishing question: Was there anything? in the discussion this morning and this afternoon that struck you? Hmm. Yeah, uh, the health care that Roxanne uh, brought to the forefront, you know, uh, brought up, I, I, it's a really important situation. You know, I think not much difference on um, the political arena. It's kind of, you know, doing what it's doing. But I, I really like that discussion today. That was important. Yeah, um, the um, one that struck me that I was trying to get some feedback is that um, I, I believe that Mr. Trump actually has kind of touched some strong triggers in the kind of work, um, blue collar, manual, um, lower middle class voter. And I, I, what I was trying to through our guests was trying to get some insight and I, I think I think it's a mixture of um, discontent with their economical situation they even though you're a, a, a semi-skilled worker your wages haven't really gone up linked to probably unfair but a resentment around immigration linked to the recent attacks this immigration muslim this feeling of the outsider um, and the resentment is combined with economic frustration and that's where i think mr trump has really kind of um managed to to kind of zero into would you agree with that nick yep absolutely absolutely yeah and uh you know, this my earlier short term things was that, you know, he was going to uh, implode. But then we had uh, um, Paris, then we had San Bernardino and uh, that just ramped up the fear. And then the the uh, GOP debate was all about ramping up the fear. It was the whole thing. That's uh, that's all they talked about. They spent one about a minute talking about infrastructure. But none of the other important issues were even spoken about. And it wasn't it funny how in chorus, every last one of them, all nine of them, would use the word uh, Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. They never mentioned one or the other. They always mentioned them together. And they, it, they might as well have all stood like a chorus and just all together now. 
uh, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton. I mean, well, they it was, were. I mean, Secretary of State, President. What you say? It's Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton. <laughs> what can I say? They were. That's, in the Democrat Party, in, there's a lot of writing about this. You've got the Clinton part of the Democrat Party, which is very strong. Clinton's control a lot of the party. There's leadership within a party. And then you know, the president. Generally, when the president's elected, he's the leader of the party. But in this case, the Clintons, they say, may have been a stronger leader than Obama. And that, well, that's I'm not the- arguing about that, Bill. What I'm saying, it, it seems so uh, choreographed because in the, the other – the Pretty previous obvious. Republican uh, debates, you didn't hear that. You heard they'd attack one or the other, but you didn't hear, you know, those two names together. And every single candidate, every single time would say, you know, Obama, Clinton, Obama, Clinton, Clinton, Obama. And and it was like uh, they had all agreed. They all uh, agreed that this is what we're going to do. You know, Nick, I, I've been, about that. I, was a, I was a nominee for Congress. And uh, you once you get to that level, you start getting talking points. So the, the Republican Party equally puts those talking points and Democrats do the same thing out to the candidates. So they say these are some of the strategies we believe you can be stronger in as Republicans and help the party mm-hmm. by hitting on these talking points. And they're printed off. Boom, boom, boom. There's usually 10 of them. You memorize them. And so that's some of the talking points that they suggested going that direction. I mean, no, no doubt. No doubt. The Democrats do the same thing. The difference in the Democrats is only like three people up on the stage and you've got you know a lot of Republicans running. And the other thing, too, and it's pretty obvious – And it appears this way that the Democrat machine, the Clinton side of the Democrat machine is in the Democrat Party is taking control. Yeah, but what what I I find interesting, Bill, is that this this um, this phenomena around Mr. Trump is not unusual. It was also very prevalent in the UK in the last general election in the UK. There was this deep frustration of a lot of lower and working class um, people Um, and they uh, were attracted to um, a a party called the UK Independence Party that basically wants to leave Europe um, um, and also wants to stop all immigration into the UK and also promotes um, they haven't really spelled out how they would do it, but also wants to encourage immigrants already in the country to leave the country. And um, <laughs> um, encourage, I, I know I know somebody who works for the organization. Um, depends what you mean by encourage, doesn't it? Um, yeah. um, I, I know somebody who works for that organization. Um, he actually worked on the first Bush's administration as a speechwriter when he was young. And we've known him since he was, you know, a kid kid next door in our community and he actually works his dad's from scotland and they're very wealthy yeah but he grew up in the united states but let me tell you that that i know that organization and they actually you know uh, the english do not use they use the pound they do not use the euro yeah and that's the organization that got them to stay on the uh the pound wow sterling well um no pound they use the pound they call it the pound but what was interesting um was that when it came to the election they didn't do as well as they were hoping. Um, mm. Even their leader didn't get, um, didn't um, maintain his seat in Parliament. But what it did do, it actually affected the socialist um, Labour vote more than the Conservative vote. Um, it affected more kind of people that you would expect would vote. Um, um, socialist or Labour actually turned to that party because of their stringent anti-immigration um, position, Nick. And this is one of the things why I don't see Mr. Trump as a buffoon, because I think he's well aware that a populist anti-establishment about economics mixed with an anti-immigration um, attitude is very popular. Popular is the word, yep. Hey, hey, guys, what I want to do is let's stay on, but I'm going to shut off the recording oh, a little longer than I want now, to. Bill. No, stay on for, no, no, Jonathan, stay on for a second. I want to invite people to come in non-recorded. I'm going to see if that makes a difference. And what, let's listen to the nice sound here. So we'll start. Because, yeah, Bill, I, I, I'm going to have to be going to in a few. Yeah, okay, let's, 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 soon, Bill. Let's, let's close this up, right? You know, my good old uh, sound machine needs to be replugged in maybe. 
it gets it gets impedance and feedback, which is not good. So that's not working. So let me unplug a few things. It's uh, sad. I love I love the I love the uh, earphones, Nick. <laughs> I know they're big. They sure are clear, though. Yeah. And I, I do like the fact that it dampens uh, extraneous sound. You know. What's What's the sound that's he doing actually? I'm playing with the uh, the disgusting, <laughs> probably Chinese built system here. Oh right, communist built system. Oh yeah. God. So that's how we finish up. We went too long. On here's here's a little bit of review did great on the itunes section i think we went too long on the youtube it means we're gonna have to wait a long time to cut it <laughs> hey this is bill um we had a great show today um it really worked out well hopefully it all downloads to youtube which it should we went a little long but uh, again i want to thank everybody out there especially the listeners and the people up in blab and uh, especially rob for coming in from the outside thank you i need more help from the right Come on, my right frame. My Northern Nevada is like clueless when it comes to technology. They're like, oh, hard to explain. I got to get those guys more involved. Take care.